Yeah. Foreplay presented by Bar Stool Sports. We are live from the driving range here at the PGA Championship 2022. And I think that the phrasing we're using is we have a jam packed episode of Foreplay leading into the year's second major championship. We have one of the hotter men in the streets in terms of golf journalism and golf headlines right now, Alan Shipnuck, whose book on Phil Mickelson came out this week. His quotes from that book, his excerpts in February, basically uh, for the time being ended Phil's public golf career. So we have uh, nearly an hour, I think it's 50 minutes straight with Alan Shipnuck the, getting um, into everything about Phil. And then also we have our boy Adrian from TaylorMade Golf who goes into all the equipment choices that players are making including in insane detail on Tiger Woods, and then Tommy Fleetwood joins the show with him to go sure. through it. Um, so I wanted to get that in, Trent, but um, go ahead. The rip-roaring biography, unauthorized. unauthorized biography of golf's most colorful superstar. Is the name it's of the book. I believe that's the name of it. We go over that a lot with Alan, but I just wanted people to know off the top what that book is called. I, and it's a good book. Alan was a great guest. You know, I, I just three weeks ago talked about how you know, books bore me from time to time, yeah. and I like to watch movies. And obviously, when it comes to biographies, you need books because you know, you're anti books a little a bit. And yeah. Could turn into a documentary. Fahrenheit 451. I um, if I start recommending books to you, you think you'd read them? I told you I, I, I was. I haven't finished it, but that uh, Dave Grohl book I was reading. While I was arguing about not liking books, I, was, I had the book in my hotel room. That That's day. right. Can you um, recommend books to me? I like books. Okay. I yeah. want to read that one book where they go to Mars. And oh, fuck, I just keep think <laughs> I keep forgetting the name of it. Everyone says it's my. It's right up my alley. Anyway, Alan Shipnuck was great for an author and like a nerd guy that I thought was gonna be nerdy. He was fucking awesome. Super down to earth. Really cool guy. I could talk to that guy for hours, even though I didn't really talk much in the interview because I did not read the book yet. He's also the side of this world. That we're just not. And it's good to have mm -hmm. different perspectives on this show. Like we talked about last show how we show up to these majors, these events, with no plan and just hope good things are going to happen. And then they sometimes do when we get to hang out with Tiger Woods for an hour. True. But then there's guys like What's Alan up, and there's guys like Danny Rappaport and Dylan DeChair who are here hunting for stories and have a plan on what to do. And it's just good to get that into the mix a little bit just to see what that side is like. And they're necessary, right? Big time. Those guys are incredibly necessary, and they are not part of the guard that has been uh, opposing of us arriving. They've been much, they very much embraced us on the scene. Yeah, I, there, were, there was some confusion with the old man golf stuff when that was all was. happening, that like we don't like um, traditional like print I media. Said, I just said how to Bones. Well, you did just say how to yeah. Bones. We talked to Bones on the range yesterday. I just said how to Bones. Bones, is, Bones got us waters. He walked over, didn't even ask us, came back and handed each one of us waters. Yeah, Hideki Matsuyama. With Robert, incredibly right calm you. demeanor, I would say, Bones handed Bones us is that. so cool. There but there's, hold on, right, wait, wait. There was a little bit with that old man golf media stuff that right, Decky. we um the people didn't think that we liked Frankie traditional just tried to, all right and media. I got literally next no nope. the Less only than thing nothing from the us. only problem pan behind we you Brendan pan behind you Brendan was that we they right. attacked us over here over here over here they attacked okay. us <laughs> you were making me nervous old man media attacked us <laughs> what's going We're on here he just held he held the camera on. you're continuously just talking about old man media but we yeah, got Decky just in our crew right now yeah, but he's not coming over no, here. No, I know. I was just talking about his surroundings, and for the you people on YouTube, they were watching. That's the true. <laughs> it's fucking insane. My point is, I don't. We don't need it anymore. Um, I kind of lost my, my train of thought there. The interview with Alan Shipnuck is phenomenal. It is he's a very. Uh, he's a very human. He's he's a human guy. And what I say by that is like when you're writing books about somebody, if you're not very much attached to like humanity and reality it can be easy to kind of skewer people and we get a lot into what that process is like and the empathy that's required and that he sort of exercised in writing the book i thought that part was phenomenal agreed we talk about the off the record on the record stuff that stuff is phenomenal we get into phil mickelson obviously it's glaring that he's not here every player that's done an interview has been asked about that the word that they've all been used is pretty much sad they're all calling it sad that phil's not here so that's a huge storyline and we talk obviously a ton about phil with alan shipnuck and he's done a great job of yes being part of the legitimate journalistic writing crew uh, while also now, you know, spinning that off into the Fire Pit Collective with him, Matt Janella, telling stories in a much more modern way. They've guys have done a, a, a phenomenal job. So having Shipnuck's on, awesome. His book, Phil, the rip roaring and unauthorized biography of golf's most colorful superstar. Fucking crushed it. That is now available. So go buy that and read it. Trent and I read it. Frank, Frankie didn't. I was on a bachelor party. And then Adrian. Would you have read it if you didn't have a bachelor party? I would have skimmed through it. Okay. Adrian Rietveld. Is that how you say his last name? 
who's the man who comes on and talks all about equipment. He's a golf nut. That stuff is so fascinating. The decisions that these guys make. He talks about actually um, uh, how important it is for even the average golfer like us to get fitted because they pretty much with one swing, even if you think you're inconsistent, there's no way I might be one player on day on Monday and another player on Tuesday. They actually just instantly get a mold of what your swing is like and what your tendencies are like and can fit you to the best clubs. TaylorMade's the best at that in the world. They have the number one golfer in the world, um, which is a good friend of ours, Scotty Scheffler, the Masters champ. They have Tiger Woods, the best player to ever play the game. They have Rory, who our guy, you're not going to believe Adrian's reaction when we talk about Rory's chances this week. If you don't watch this podcast on YouTube, if you are just a Spotify, iTunes person, that's fine. But this time around, go to this timestamp. Go to the timestamp of what watching. Are we, like, about six minutes in, five, five minutes and thirty seconds in. Go to YouTube. Go to that, and then. But I want them to see oh, Adrian's. Shit. I want them to I see. Thought, I got that fucked up. I want them. You to have see, to go when he comes on. I want them to see Adrian's face when he talks about Roy McIlroy. So watch this one on YouTube if you get a chance. Watch it on YouTube. Check it out. And Not then at five minutes and thirty seconds. And there's a lot of things that have gone on that we have to get to as well. First, we got to talk about SiriusXM. You should be listening to the SiriusXM app at home or anywhere you are. No car required. Our friend Colt Nost, who we talked to a lot this week, he's on the PGA Tour SiriusXM channel. He heard about Frankie's hole out on 17. Yeah, right. he did. He was actually um, um, per- perpetuating that rumor. Yeah. Yeah, perpetuating that rumor on uh, on SiriusXM. Right. We ghosted so, him in New Orleans. Yeah, he's still upset about that. Yeah. Well, Went to I dinner t- with him, and he was like, "You guys are gonna come grab a drink." I said, "I'm gonna go bring Trent home," and we just <laughs> never came back out. And he texted me the next day. He says, "Still bringing Trent home?" Yeah. See, so you go <laughs> see him. Text. I make it very clear whenever I'm wherever I'm at with whoever I'm at. Like when I'm done here, I'm leaving. I'm going back. Yeah. yeah. That's it. So then you, Frankie can do whatever he wants to do. And yeah, he's, he's still he's still taking me back to the hotel. Sirius okay. XM. You can stream it all on your phone, online, or at home. Over 425 channels are on the Sirius XM app. Enjoy ad-free music channels for every genre and artist, dedicated channels. Catch the live play-by-play of games from every major sports league and 24-7 sports talk from the biggest names in sports. Um, subscribe now. Get your first three months for free of the SiriusXM app. You visit SiriusXM.com slash pod offer to sign up. Offer details apply once again. Please visit SiriusXM.com slash Ford Play Pod offer to sign up. Subscribe now. Get your first three months for free of the Sirius XM app. Um, and then we also have Dustin Johnson video that came out. Uh, that's not in this podcast. That's on YouTube, and it's just available right now. We have DJ shows how to get stingers. Somebody tweeted at me a very funny video of my reaction to one of his stingers, and I was just jumping up and down because it was so awesome. But he rips stingers, and then he plays against us in a rematch. He plays left-handed. Used my golf clubs, which was pretty wild. Something that I forgot happened until we rewatched the video. Um, I kind of was just carrying my golf bag, and he's like, can I get a 60 degree? And I just like handed him mine, and he's using it, and he's like looking at him and handing him back, and he's like, you like this putter? And all this, kind of wild. So, again, these videos are so insane that you forget that they happen. It's like you have to remind yourself what the fuck is actually going on around here that we played again against Dustin Johnson, and one even of the best players of like, all time. We're so busy this week and most weeks where, like, we're at the PGA Championship. We were doing the Tulsa Tango last night, which was an incredible event. Seemed like everybody had a blast. And then, like, as that's going on, I'm like, oh, yeah, we have a Dustin Johnson video coming out as well. It's just the boys are doing a lot all the time, so we do get desensitized sometimes. But please go watch that Dustin Johnson We've had a dominant week. We've had a dominant dominant week. week. Tiger Woods, obviously. We took over the world. We've been doing kind of a victory lap for a few days. Yeah, but then, like like you're saying, we were at the Tulsa Tango, at the Fortune Golf Course, (laughs) Under the lights, it was like eight o'clock at night, and while that's happening, we have how many people? It was like 120 golfers, just like a last-minute tournament that we put on. It was like the most insane thing ever. Two-man scramble par three tournament. As that's all happening, I'm looking out at all these hundreds of golfers that are playing with us. Yeah, we're playing with Dustin Johnson on YouTube live at that point. I'm just like, how the how the fuck is all this happening right now? It's kind of a mind fuck. So um, there's Ian Poulter just walked by. You want to have him on the show? Ian Poulter just walked by. Looked He's pretty right tall, at us. huh? He is pretty tall, and he always has, like, a backpack on. He, he never looks like any of the other guys where he looks like the guy that's, like, part of the team. You know Not the I mean? guy that the team is around? 100%. Yeah. Which I, I actually kind of like that about him, that he's, like, you know. I think if he came over here, he'd punch me in the face. I don't think so. Yeah, dude, we have Trevor Erlman's. We have Trevor Erlman's. So, yeah, I'll text him. We'll get him on the show. And then he looked up, like, 30 seconds later, he's like, he's never going to be show. More, he hates you guys. You know, like, we need something to like bridge the gap. We need to learn about like Ferraris or like F1. Like we really need to learn how, how to, to like berate, you know, how about this next people. tournament that we go to wear a Ferrari hat. Okay. 
Maybe do a little bit of research. Ferrari, I know you don't like reading, but a Ferrari if, F1. What's like, your favorite team? F1. I don't have an allegiance yet. I'm a. I became a huge Lewis Hamilton fan. Yeah. But that's because I thought he got so fucked at the end of last year. Yeah. I, I, I'm not caught up. That's okay. Okay. That's I okay. just didn't want any spoilers. No, no. Uh, I mean, it's a. Yeah. I. I wouldn't say I it's necessarily can, a spoiler. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. You like, can do that with like live sports. I think that's different. Really? I think the F1 is different because think it's about like live every every Ooh, weekend. It happened like, like a year ago. Twitter. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I'm feeling attacked. But like Logan Spence like blogs about it every single week. No. Okay. But think about this. Think about when you first start watching spoiler. the show. That stuff had already happened and you didn't know anything. Right. About it. That's why I said I think it's a little different with sports, but it, it's like the that, same thing. Okay. Okay. But that was far enough what? in the past. It was like five years ago. What's, what's it's the same show? But when, when the when the show first comes on, it came out a couple years. People started watching it like after all that stuff had happened. Oh, I thought you meant like think about when you're watching a show like fucking Ozark. No, or something. this one's different. We're talking it's about this specific, very specific documentary series. I know. Okay. I, I I think something that happened within the last six eight months. I don't know that you can really blame us for a spoiler because like it's a it was a, like a live. Like Lewis event. Hamilton was the driver of the year, and you don't want to know any of that information because you haven't watched the Netflix recap of it. I'm that's just correct. That I'm that's correct. That's fucking insane. Okay. okay, thank you. I'm just saying that I think there's probably people out there who watch that show that don't watch the F1 races. Okay, okay but, but don't watch it. But like you're gonna see it on Twitter. People choice, are like reacting to it by on not watching the F1 races. You now have. Given up your right to not get spoiled because it's an F1 race. It I happens. I'm every not weekend. trying to spoil you. I'm no. just saying that like well, I'm not going to feel bad if you get it because it happened in real life like six months ago. It's like saying uh-huh. like you've chosen to not watch Ozark for like a year and then get mad when people are like spoiling. Like I, I, like I would say a year for a regular TV show. That's how in the moment F1 is. I don't agree with that whatsoever. It's also like, like like whoever on did TV. won or lost that race was on like Sports Center with Scott Van Pelt. Like that just happens. It's TV. You know, I know. You don't see what we're saying. I what I'm saying is that when you first started watching this show, it's that situation. But my point to that was that it was so far in the past that I think, right? Like when I started watching it, it was like four years ago. So clearly, I I haven't. You don't want to give people that same chance. I want to give them a chance, but I don't think I should have to feel bad if that chance gets ruined because, like, it's a real talking point in con- contemporary like for society. For us not being F1 fans and we watch Drive to Survive, we don't have the right now to be like, like, if we're talking to an F or someone that actually watches F1, we can't be like, oh, I just started watching this show, so don't tell me anything that's happened in the last four years of sport. They're going to be <laughs> like, what do you, like, that's not my fault that you didn't watch sport. You haven't watched I wouldn't, I think that's totally event fair. That's happened every weekend. Like, I think that's totally fair. Really? Like if someone brought up Game of Thrones, so you, so so then you should not watch the NFL and then watch uh, Tom Brady's documentary that comes out on ESPN Plus and be like, don't tell me what happened in the Super Bowl. No, I because that's a very popular <laughs> U.S. sport. I'm <laughs> saying everyone's pretty new to that's this. Pretty popular, bigger than yeah, they're doing like two Grand Prix now in the U.S. But not here. I'm saying <laughs> you have this look. Well, not in Tulsa, that you're no, like, but like you're gonna. I mean, no, crying. don't be an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> don't be a fucking asshole. All right. Don't condescend him. He's not in Tulsa. <laughs> Cut his fucking mic off. All I'm saying <laughs> I'm trying is to that. Don't get angry. I didn't get much sleep last night, if we're being honest. Really? Yeah. Why? Why? I don't know. I just couldn't sleep. Do you have a Snickers? Can someone get this guy a Snickers? You're not yourself when, Dewey, you're, not when you're hungry. Uh, bones will get you one again. Dewey and you're bones. not yourself when you're hungry. Let's move on. I was right. So, uh, a couple things I want to touch on. Picks for this week. We're all going to hammer roar, and you'll hear why oh in a few minutes. Oh, my God. Um, and then I have to shout out. Kirk Minahan, who said Sam Burns, Cameron Young, and Davis Ryway. That's a group that's going off tomorrow morning. He said someone from this group will win the tournament. Now, the only reason I bring that up, I, I texted back and said, you're a delusional moron. But he's been really hot this year. And a few people have called. They, he does calls on his show. And, if, and Kirk's a, a golf obsessed. So if people call in. One guy hit him with, like, um, I think it was for the Valspar. Hit him just randomly with, Kirk, who's going to be the lowest European finish this week? And he just goes, uh... Matthew Fitzpatrick, book it. And it was Matthew Fitzpatrick, like, in a landslide. Bang. And then, like, he, that same week, they were like, who do you like to win? And he's like, man, eh, Sam Burns. Sam Burns won that tournament back-to-back year. So, like, the only reason I'm throwing that out there, yes, I think he's a moron. He also said Tiger Woods could miss the cut. But if you – I want people to be aware that he's been pretty hot this year and he threw those picks out there. Um, we are – are we agreeing that we're all going to at least sprinkle something on Scotty Scheffler because we're pissed that we didn't at the Masters and he yes. was the most obvious choice in the world and right then he now, just won it? Wednesday at whatever time it is, 2 o'clock. What time is it? Pretty close, 2.57. 2.57. Um, 
He's plus eleven hundred, I think, on the Barcelona sports. Would you book. consider that pretty close? Yeah. Well, yeah. gauging yeah, yeah. off the fact that we have no idea. Yeah, what time yeah, right. Is. I don't Not, even know what time we got here. Like mm-hmm. we've been here for three hours, four hours. I have no idea. Look at the sun. I have a buddy that was in the um, yeah, Boy Scouts, and he could tell the time by putting his hand to the horizon and how many fingers went up to the sun. You could go off the when the sun's gonna set, but and every change, finger is like an hour does it or half hour. Every, uh, it sounds like depending on what time watch. of year. Huh? Does it change in what time of year? Dude, because doesn't the sun goes across a different know, angle dude. depending on what time of year? He wasn't really in our friend group. He played baseball with gotcha, us when we were yeah. younger. And Sounds he like a nerd. baseball over the fence, like, and we have to go get it. Like, you can't throw the baseball over the fence while we're in the game. I'd like to say yesterday we hung out with uh, Joey LaCava for like an hour. And that guy is the best yeah. man in the world. I love yeah, him so I, much. I don't know that I've ever met someone that I've liked more. You guys are perfect for each other. You we two just are, like yeah. gel and we connect and I like I'm not the biggest like eye contact guy. I like I struggle with like keeping contact with people, especially E Bug's got a good he's got a good looking face and I know someone there. here. I know someone not who's not here who's a huge eye contact guy. Oh Lurch. Huge. Fucking drives me crazy. Well, he's behind the wheel especially mostly. while I was driving. Well, he's like specifically when he's hour. driving. But Joey will like eye like, contact I, I wanna, with everyone in the vehicle. He just no matter what he, seat he, you're he in. locks you in. Like when he says something to you, you're like, Oh shit, I'm in the zone now. And we just, I don't know, he's a Northeast guy, he's a huge Rangers fan, Giants fan, Yankees fan, and I just think he loves sports so much, loves all the draft picks and college picks and all the guys coming up in the Rangers system, and, and I know a lot about that stuff, so I'm able to connect with him rather than someone I mean, I else he, that he I don't know He kind of smiles about. as he says everything. He does, yeah. He makes so you feel good. Yeah, it's like this is a positive interaction. And he's like, let's what? golf. I have a couple months off in between, like, you know, majors and stuff. You're like, with like, me? I was you want to play golf with me? Yeah, he he literally said like I'm playing next week. You want to play? I was like I'm not at the fucking Barcelona Classic, but I can I can I can just change my schedule. I'll just not be at the Barcelona. Yeah, Classic. he's just the me. nicest guy of all time. We also talked to SVP today. We did, yeah. Who equally has that same aura around him, where everything he says, you just want to make sure you're paying attention to, because he's the nicest guy ever. He's so well thoughtful, and he's well informed, and and he just wants just another guy from like. My childhood. We essentially, not even childhood, like I went just to sleep, my teenage years. I went years. to sleep watching SVP when he got that midnight hour. Yeah. Is Every SVP the, night. the top sports media figure in the country? Probably Charles Barkley, I think Trent would say. I think it's Barkley. But I think SVP's I think they're right close. There. I think they're close. SVP has the midnight. In terms of overall star power. Prime time, ESPN, his own show. He, I mean, he's a superstar. I'm not, I, I'm not, when I say Barkley, I'm not taking anything away from SVP because he's a, a legend and a superstar. I think it's close. I think those two are very close. I think, I think Chuck is like my favorite. Stephen overall, A. Smith is up there. I think SVP is though just like, yes. like Stephen A. Smith is a caricature, right? To a degree. Yeah, but he's huge. No, he's huge. I'm not saying he's not, but he's a bit of a caricature. SVP is just SVP. Yes. He's himself. He interviews everyone. Yep. He, he, right. Not he after, delivers yeah. and anchors everything. Like he is just, he's as big as it gets. When I saw you guys talking to him, I was like, whoa. Yeah. Every time he's one of those guys where every time I'm talking to him, I'm like, I can't, I can't believe, you're believe talking. I'm talking to this guy. And dude, he knows about us. He did. He talked to you about the aisles, dude, I, Borelli's. We, we're, I, we're not even wearing. You're wearing a Barcelona transfusion thing, but you know, and Stanford Steve, I've gone out for, for drinks with him, so I knew he's, that he was going to remember great. us. He's a yeah. big Barcelona guy, big cat guy. They both are, but um, we dapped him up, and I'm like, oh, this, he's not going to fucking remember us. Like we had a half an hour conversation with him last year at Kiwa. The guy talks sports every single night for a living and meets a billion people. First thing he says to me is, he's like, man, we're missing your Islanders runs at Borelli's with Stu. I'm like, holy fucking shit, man, it's Scott Van Pelt. That's Him and I got into a uh, disagreement that I wish he would come on the podcast we could talk about with uh, the golf oh, shots. Yeah, you did. And I also wanted – well, no, actually – I was almost going to do this thing to tell him how big a fan I am of him. I used to tweet at him, uh, where in the world is SVP, when I see a bald guy wearing headphones. And I think one time he retweeted, it was like the biggest moment of my life. That's awesome. I have to go back and look on my Twitter, but um, that's how big of a fan I am, that he does shit like that, that I used to do shit like that with him. But, yes, you guys did get into a huge debate where he was, like, taking his glasses off and yeah. looking at you being like, you know, I, he goes, you know, um, what's going on? There's a spider, There's a spider on your trip. What a day. Dude, just fucking just hit him. I in. hate just, spiders. Just take him uh, He's really neck. close to your chin, actually. Where is it? He's on your... Oh, well, you got to find him. Somebody... somebody Look I down. See it, am I looking at two friends oh, or no? Oh, yeah, yeah, Am I looking yeah, at no, two friends or no? Legit. Am I looking yeah, yeah, at two yeah, friends we'll or no? Him, we'll get rid of him. All right. For, we did that for content. We had to do that. All right. Um, you guys got into a debate He's right on your lanyard. Um... Do you guys scoreboard watch? Yeah, so who was the tour pro that we had on recently? Because we've always had tour pros on and we ask, do you scoreboard watch? And they almost, you can barely finish the question before they say, yeah, you have to, you got to know where you're at. And then someone had said, play the shots to its merits. Doesn't matter. You just have to respect the shot and play it. 
and that's the best way to do it. And I thought that was interesting. And I brought that up to SVP, and he said, yeah, that, that only goes so far, though, because – and he brought up the example of um, the Heat played the Celtics last night. And if the Heat are down by – two or three like they got to know what kind of shot they need here at the end so it was an interesting debate and i get what he's saying but i would like to i'd like to talk more about it with him yeah a nice debate was svp yeah, yeah glasses great. came off they were cleaning them while they're talking oh, wow both of them? A huge glass we're having a glass guy glasses move. cleaning off when you start taking your glasses off and you start cleaning them as you're talking about something, yeah. you're really in a debate. I should have taken my glasses off, started cleaning them. No, that's what I thought you, know you were going like, to have a glasses such a, off cleaning like, All right, contest. now we're really talking. Seinfeld's got this old joke where he says, anybody, it's hard to win an argument with somebody who's smoking a cigarette because once they, they finish the cigarette, throw it down, <laughs> stomp on it, like, and they make their last point and then they walk away. <laughs> It's something like that. I don't mean Dude, to. It's I don't mean so to. good because that's exactly. I think when someone takes their glasses off and starts to clean them on their chest, on their shirt, I think whatever they're saying is ten times more valuable than had it, they not done. That, that says I'm about to put a lot of thought into this next thing. Big time. And then think about me watching it happen, and it's SVP, <laughs> guy who knows more about sports than maybe anybody on the planet. That's you conversational exactly dominance, me, right? Like an older oh, yeah. guy going like, <sighs> yeah, you know. I'm like, he's, he's just thinking back, and I'm thinking brain. it's gonna be hard to refute whatever point this guy makes. <laughs> you know, I just. Uh, <laughs> He, he puts some fucking breath on him and cleans him. I was like, I don't know about that, Trent. That's literally what he did. Yeah. All right. You're in trouble at that point. Yeah, it was good, though. I'd love to have him on the show and we can talk about it. Love to. Um, so we're going to throw it to these interviews here in a second. We're going to talk about Play Golf Myrtle Beach, which people have now been hitting us up here in whispers that we're about to go to Myrtle Beach here this summer and play a bunch of golf. Uh, I'm Every time we bring this up, I get more and more jacked up for Myrtle Beach because I think we're not going to just play golf, even though it's the golf capital of the world. I want to hit like a wave runner. I want to I see saw, like a shock. I want to see everything. I want to see everything Myrtle Beach has to offer, and I think we're, that's what's going to happen to Dude, us. Myrtle Beach, I think, has like gators, sharks, oceanfront property, uh, top 100 courses, munis, beaches. Everything. Sand volleyball. Can we play sand volleyball? What are you saying? Beach volleyball. Volleyball? Volleyball. Sand volleyball. 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 I thought you, it just sounded, it hit Was my ear. Volleyball? I think you said sand volleyball. volleyball. <laughs> beach volleyball i just i was going on my tw- on my instagram and man it's been getting crazy with like the suggested for you posts on instagram where it's like i feel like i'm following these accounts i you can mute those whatever i didn't want to mute this one because it was a myrtle beach account it wasn't myrtle beach golf it was another myrtle beach account but they were showing this one golf hole of a guy basically it was behind the green style where in the morning he was just cutting the green and it was just right in the middle of this huge pond. It almost looked like TPC Sawgrass. And I was just like, man, that place, like there's just thousands of golf courses like that in that area. And it's amazing, the quality Billions, of courses. Man. There's a, It's not just the quantity, it's the quality as well. The, no matter where you book, you're gonna have like an outrageous experience. It is the golf capital of the world and is the home to the whack Golf Trail. Wow. The whack Golf Trail features 11 of the most sought after courses in Myrtle Beach area. From famed designers Gary Player, friend of the program, Tom Fazio, Jack Nicholas, and Mike Strantz. Two of the courses on the whack a mole Golf Trail, TBC Myrtle Beach, and True Blue Golf Club have been ranked among the top public golf courses in the country. And the foreplay crew, yours truly, are going to be featuring these courses in our upcoming trip to Myrtle Beach later this year. Get the best deals and discounts on lodging and golf when booking your trip through mygolftrail.com. Visit mygolftrail.com and receive a free round of golf. You are welcome on the whack a Golf Trail in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. So we have, next up, Adrian Rietfeld, who is from TaylorMade. He's one of their top guys when it comes to equipment at events. He's all over. He's on that truck. He's dealing with Tiger and Rory and Tommy and all these guys. Tommy Fleetwood joins this conversation. We're going to throw it to Adrian. We're going to come back. We're going to do a little bit from the gallery, and then we're going to throw it to Alan Shipnuck, and then we're going to go have ourselves a great tournament weekend in Scottsdale, which, by the way, if you're listening to this show and you are in the Arizona area, make sure Casa Amigos Bar Restaurant, awesome spot, fun, from around 11 a.m. on until the end of the coverage, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we're going to do live stream, and we're going to do a PGA Championship watch party with Owens Mixers at Casa Amigos in Scottsdale. Lurch is going to rejoin the crew. Oh. We're going to be there. The producers are going to be there. I thought we were going to have more room on our logos. Jake Bass and Brendan Jones are going to be there. Trent Ryan, Frankie Borelli, Riggs, Lurch. I can't believe I'm going back to Scottsdale. I want to go back to Scottsdale. I do. I want to watch the the, the PJ Championship. Is Hannah Cook going to be there? 
Hannah Cook's going to be there for Hannah the Cook's Barstool Classic on there. Monday and Tuesday. She'll be there for the Barstool Classic. I'm just... Uh, she must be busy. I'm just... It's hot, man. It's hot there. And it's hot here. And I just, you know... You don't really have to say anything right now. We could just throw it to the interview. Just letting you know. It's it's going to be hot. No, it's going to be hot. No doubt. It'll be a dry heat. Here's Adrian. Ladies and gentlemen, we are joined live from the PGA Championship here at Southern Hills. Our, um, I would say... Adrian is now our uh, <laughs> major equipment championship, consultant. yeah, tailor-made equipment consultant. What's awesome. your actual title? I'm the senior manager for tour at TaylorMade Golf. Okay, yeah. we're gonna go whatever with whatever that is. Yeah, whatever that is. We're gonna go with the Barstool golf, golf major championship equipment consultant. I would love Barstool in my job title. Okay, <laughs> all right, yeah, awesome. we can get you a business card. Now. Is, before we even start, <laughs> this is why TaylorMade and this partnership is next level, and why TaylorMade is the greatest company on the planet Earth when it comes to golf. Because I was talking to another person in a competitive on a competitive podcast that was Boo. like. How the hell do you guys? Oh, I thought you were saying it? another equipment company. I'm no, not booing well, they, they're sponsored by another equipment company, okay, and they're right, like, right. "Must be nice to work with like a brand that actually gets it." You know what I mean? Like you guys are actually doing stuff like this, and we get to do the media day stuff. Like you guys are, you guys are actually aligned with our thinking and where golf should go. They and made that's, you mean, you mean a bit futuristic as opposed to historic? Hundred <laughs> percent. Nice line. You know, like people like listening right now, wherever they are, they're in their cubes, and I'm not going to go uh, about the Johns and the Roberts that are listening to this. Where the I Robs. Talk, the Robs are sitting. My buddy Rob hasn't smiled at work in 13 years. He literally says Once. he doesn't laugh at work. He just punches in numbers <laughs> and then goes home and gets, becomes a crazy person. It's like Hunger Games. <laughs> But that this is what they want to hear. They want to hear what you're about to tell us. Like, what's actually going on out here? What, like, the human aspect. Why is Rory changing something? And why is Tiger putting in one club and not another club? It's really cool to hear. It's not just like yeah. X's and O's and numbers on a screen. So, so it's really cool. Let's narrow it down a little bit. It is very cool. Uh, Tiger Woods, we'll start with him. He's the biggest story in the world sure. of golf. Our buddy, my brother. Uh, you know, I saw yesterday on the internet <laughs> that he is uh, not going with a five, but he's going with a two iron. What's the yeah, what's the true. backstory with that? How involved are you in that? Um, I mean, I, I, I would say I'm involved in the background. He's got his his key guys around him. You know, he, they'll they'll brainstorm ideas. And uh, you know, when he played here yeah, a while, at, you know, when 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 the majors were here before, he hit a lot of long irons. It's, it's, yep. It seems like, although they've changed the golf course, you know, for him, he still sees sees the course with the same kind of. You know, strategy. If you, okay. If, if so, so be it. Even right. though it's changed. Yeah, I think I think I think the the shaping of the holes and stuff. He still sees. You know, you're looking at, you know, the the best iron player ever to hit this hit the planet, right? Yep. So, right. Yeah, and this is a second shot golf course where you've got to hit, you know, irons which which are so precise. So you um, need to be in the fairway to do that. Yeah, fairway off the tee, but it's really a second shot golf course, yep. right? So so for him, you know, he he's so good at that second shot, and if he can get himself into position to to execute that, I think, and, and, and I think the big story is the fact that it's a two iron and a three iron that's gone that's gone into his bag. I mean, you're looking at taking out a five wood. He's probably the best five wood player in the world as well because he's, he sees so many different shots. And a, a five wood is a piece of equipment that requires you to cover a huge gap in your bag. You, you know, think of how long these guys are, right? So right. if you hit if you hit your driver 320 and you hit your three wood. 280 right that's very you know, relatable you, you, definitely <laughs> and then you got and then you look and then you look at your longest iron if your longest iron is a four iron or a three iron that's only going 230 so you've got from 280 to 230 to cover so how you, you're covering 50 60 yards with one club it's a five wood it's you can hit you can hit them low you can hit them high you can fill that gap so you know to take that out you must see the course in a very very specific way um, and and obviously have the ability to cover that gap with those clubs as well. Right. So when he does, you know, and I think Colin, Colin similar, he took a wood out this week and a lot put of, a long uh, iron in. A lot of guys, man. Why are, are they doing that? Why is the, you know, why? Because to, to most players and or most fans, whatever, my thinking is like the five wood would come in higher. A hybrid yeah. comes in higher and softer. The greens are obviously, you know, going to be pretty firm. And, and so I'm wondering why are they basically – deciding for something that generally comes in a little lower and more piercing they're trying to chase something out there yeah you can chase it off the tee but there's also going to be 20 to 30 mile an hour winds all week so when you're looking at you're okay. protecting the weather as well gotcha um i mean you you're trying to keep it under these trees there's big big trees around just so you 
you know try and keep it under the wind get it I, I mean it's fairly firm it's fairly firm but it's also the greens are not fast mm -hmm. you know so, so you, in terms of stopping the ball on the greens I feel like because the winds are so high and the greens are so severe you know you're going to be able to stop the ball on the greens that they're not it's not concrete so 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 your advantage yeah is getting into play getting into position and then using using your kind of mid mid irons and, and, and short irons i mean the par threes are again right the par threes are mega have you seen them out there like 240 yeah. 50. Yeah. they're crazy I mean, tiny that, greens that, that, that guy that just walked past there you see that nikolai hogard yep i mean that's that's an absolute stud okay an absolute stud 20 years old he's, he's won three times already he shouldn't even he should still be in college um taylor made athlete yet taylor made yeah he's okay. he's, he's the future bud. i'd like to see that nikolai hogard you don't <laughs> taylor made won't miss a player like that he's, oh he's my man stud. i don't know I mean, what a line is, that is this is if you can in terms of like the future you know he's you know you should go and watch him at balls we're in the future not historic exactly mm -hmm. and, and and he's um he said to me the other day, he was like, I actually hit a, a wood into a par three. He's never, oh I mean, this gosh. guy's 195 he's ball speed. I mean, he's, he's, he's never hit more than a freaking six iron. Like, what, <laughs> into a par, what into a par three? Yeah, That's no, my I, I think yeah, was, uh, I think I'm not sure which hole it was, but it's my language. He's probably. encroaching on my territory <laughs> with that type of wood. But that's really interesting that he would do that. Yeah, so he's, and he's got, a, he's got like a seven wood in his bag, and he's even said, like we're now on Wednesday, I picked the seven wood out and I, and I said, how's this thing going? He says, I haven't hit it once. In, in other words, what he's saying is that the course is not asking him to hit this, this club, right? He keeps hitting a three iron or he keeps hitting something that, 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 that suits his eye. And so I think, I don't think you dictate what you want to play. The, the, the course will kind of dictate to you what, what you need to do. And, I, and there's going to be, you know, a thing with, with like compared to the Masters, right? We chatted around the Masters. This is a... A new golf course right this right. is a new redesigned golf course so nobody's played this thing right so, they, so they're trying to work it out right it's interesting because i was listening to uh dj's interview this morning and he was talking about um his three wood and how around here he's actually going to need to hit three wood off the tee and he was like i never hit three wood off the tee it's like i either yeah, a driver he's I hit a driver guy yeah. yeah and he's <laughs> like i i literally have lived my whole career never hitting three wood off the tee yeah and now all of a sudden i'm going to need it a lot yeah so 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 getting it in play is is, is key right so there's no um there's no second, there's no first cut. Right. It's fairway and the fairways are fairly generous and, and it's rough. And, and, and the rough is, is, is interesting enough that you feel like you can do something out of it. Right, because we were walking, we yeah, walked in yeah. every day and you kind of look at it and you're like, that's, I could do, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not that maybe. bad. And but, he, it's sound, the but then you is, talk to Max and he was kind of like, it's tough. Yeah, if you, if you get greedy, you take, you, you take the, you know, in a, a, the club that you you're kind of 50-50 on you get a flyer or something like that it's going to be a tough up and down i right. think um i think like in talking to like my boss and, and 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 all like coaches and that type of thing pitching and chipping will win this tournament pitching and chipping getting up and down turning turning two shot turning three shots into two uh and they've they've, they've allowed that they've they've given the players the opportunity with all these runoffs and you know you mm -hmm. you get you get guys who can chip out of tough lies uh, and then you get you get guys who are very good chippers out of perfect lies, you know. And, th and I think that that guy, right? You know, that guy is going to be he's going to get up and down a lot. We're talking about Tiger Woods, right? Is that who we're talking about right now? <laughs> well, we're always talking about Tiger Woods. <laughs> we're he's always a, talking he's, about he's, he's number one, number two, <laughs> yeah. and number three on the list of yeah. importance. I mean, we watched him on sixteen. Oh my gosh! He he was around that green for 35, 40 yeah, Every single wall, ball was just in the hole. Or, yeah. or within a I five mean, foot you radius. Think of like Scotty Scheffler's short game, you, oh. you know. From I mean, he must be. He must, made he must be whipping his chops around. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, he can he can hit every trajectory. He's he can hit a, um, you know, he he's very comfortable hitting irons off the tees and mm -hmm. good iron player. They all play in like Tiger's irons, aren't they? All, all these guys, isn't that? It's what crazy. about Tiger's um, wedges? What, what, yeah. What's the difference between that and and someone else's wedges? Like, what is he doing differently? So he's it's MG3 wedges, okay. which, is, which is a line that we you know we, we would have at a raw face. So it's everything that we kind of put into our equipment that we would then sell to the consumer. The difference with Tiger's wedges is is that he's he's had all the input on his grinds. So so we, when you look at um, and and we and we do sell that part, the Tiger Woods grind, which is which is a, a product that we but he's designed the whole thing. Uh, the, the, the thing about that is that we're not putting the wedges on grinding wheels. 
uh, they're milled grind, so, so they're, they're on machines which are zero, zero tolerance. So, so what, what, what would happen in, in the olden days, and Tiger, you know, he'd, he'd tell you about this, you know, they'd, they'd make him six wedges he'd take because they'd have to grind them on a wheel, get, get the bounce right, get the leading edge right, get the ski right. And once, um, once he gets them, then he goes in and tests them. And, he, and literally, he, he'd hit the note and he'd, and he'd throw that wedge away and he'd hit the next one and he'd be like, no, he'd move into and the bunker. And you button. sell it on eBay for well, 10 grand. No, we, that was, this was before he was with Taylor. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, nice, too sure. Um, but, but, but now, because you've got the, the, the technology to kind of laser sketch his perfect grind, once he's happy with it, you take the wedge that, that you've made for him and you kind of CAD it and you scan it and, and the boys the boys in R&D at TaylorMade are just phenomenal and they, they'll create six or seven wedges for him of, where, of which six or seven will be perfect. As they're all they, exactly the as same. As long as they're built right. Gosh, yeah, so Tiger's that really dialed into, like, he knows his sketch. Like, like Dialed, like, man. Like, he's probably sitting dialed. down at a computer with someone being like, no, no, I want this before we, like, laser it on. Is oh, yeah. that involved he's, in that? He's, I mean, he's... he's he He's the artist the, of his own get, wedge. He gets the service, right? What the yeah. hell is happening around here? <laughs> he gets here. the service. By the way, I mean, we get that service, too. Yeah, we're on the same level. Yeah. We just don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, number one in custom. If they told you to, like, one sketch <laughs> your, your milling, what would you, like? I'd say take exactly what Tiger Woods does and give that to me. Uh, to me, go. that'd be, like, one of those tests where they're like, all right, draw a tree. And if you, like, put it with no leaves on it, it means that you're, like, a lunatic, like, depressed person. Yeah. Like to me, I'd like draw like all these lines, and they'd be like, "You're never gonna hit wedges ever again." Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. interesting. So around here, since it's tight, it's Bermuda. Yeah. It's, is are people are players using different bounces than normal, different wedges than normal? I, I, no, I think they're sticking with what they're comfortable with because okay. the the bunkers are quite gritty, right? So yep. that's something that that, that they got to get used to. And then the fairways, or the and, and the runoffs and the chipping areas. Like I was speaking to a player yesterday, and he said he played Monday and he was like really comfortable around the greens okay and then tuesday he felt like because it had rained overnight the ball was just sitting down that little bit more and he felt uncomfortable hmm. and he was like so like when he plays in the morning or when he plays in the afternoon he feels like he's got to account for that um just because of what you know the way the ball's like it, the condition's so good that the, you're going to get consistency in the lie but it is different depending on you know when, when he plays right i mean that's that's you talk about attention to detail right that's <laughs> i was like yeah yeah, like, boy, yeah boy. sure yeah. <laughs> no no i, I mean you that stuff up, is you turned fascinating. up uh, yeah you obviously not hindered as good today as you were yesterday <laughs> when <laughs> clearly how often do these guys change out their wedges um I think I think they're all they're all individual in the way they do that. I mean, there was a there was a time where we we would give Rory a, a new wedge every couple of weeks, just literally. And you know, he's a high spin player. He does. You know, I remember. Um, you know, you, then you have somebody like uh, Scotty who who will play a wedge until it's absolutely dead. Hmm, and then, interesting. And then and then. So it's 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 everyone's different. There's another there's a, there's other players that ask that give you back the the worn wedges and they ask you to re regroove them you know okay. and fix it you know almost like refurbish because yeah. they're, so they're holding on to the they're holding on to the wedge so uh because they like the they yeah like they, the, they, exactly it's just like uh, the, you know the one wedge guy <laughs> right right <laughs> uh That's since the greens this week since the greens this week are a little slower everybody's mm -hmm. talking about that there's so mm -hmm. much undulation yeah. uh, that they just kind of have to be a little bit slower mm -hmm. anybody change no. anything with with putters to make them more more hot or anything like that to make up for it? No, I think that because some of them do that for the British. Yeah, Open, they right? do, they do. But that's really slow, right? Yeah, the British, yeah. This, this is, this is that they're just trying to make sure the greens are playable in all conditions. Give it the wind, or I mean, we were on 18. I was with Fleetwood on 18. He's over there, and uh, we were the pin was kind of front left, and he, uh, all of us in the group, it was like three players. We all went to like the middle back of the green, and. It was literally who could, who could hold the green. Let's see who can hold the green just with a putt, and no, you couldn't. The ball wouldn't hold the green. So, and, and this is you know looking at these greens. I reckon oh. there must be like maybe ten and a half, whereas most tour courses are, you know, you can get up to twelve and a half, thirteen. Right. Yep. So there is a lot of slope. There's a lot, and you have to account for that. But staying under the hole is going to be key. Staying under the hole, I think. I think chipping is is everything this week. Uh, getting off the tee, getting into position. I mean, the you know, Rory McIlroy, man. Rory, Rory, Rory. I'm telling you, uh, like, I am so, so happy. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so we're hearing this. We're on, this is Wednesday. 
I feel real good about Rory McIlroy. I mean, that look you just gave was. <laughs> yeah, you were excited. But why wouldn't he be? You know, he's Rory so, McIlroy. So how, it's like a, so it's he's like a, it's Rory's got a hot this, take. Rory's got this uh, this course. It's just it's it's between Augusta and Savannah. It's called the Hoopy, Hoopy Match Club. Same designer that did. Yeah, Gil Hans, right? Gil Hans. Mm-hmm. And I promise you, man, I'm walking around there, and then I've I've been to a Hoopy and uh, Rory, amazing place. And I'm just feeling a hoopy here, man. Wow, I'm okay. He tears place. that place up. Oh, he man, just loves the it there. It's, it's, he's, he's, he's the, he had a little air. It's, it's his happy place. Wow. <laughs> it was my happy this place. It was unbelievable, man. It was, But I just like, you know, you look at how the, 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 the tee boxes like fall into the fairways. and Yeah. You know, everything's kind of one piece. And, and you go to his place and he, he must feel comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. He must do yeah. Do you guys know what the world's most powerful personalized digital fitness and health coach and official fitness wearable the PGA Tour and LPGA Tours is? I know what it is because it's on my wrist right now. What's that, Trent? It's a whoop. That color looks cool. Like it's reminiscent and uh, um, uh, gave a little flare around a big tournament. Augusta big green, tournament, maybe. Yeah, you got a different yeah. color than we do. Pine green. Black, pine green. I've got the black. Black I like your the 4. heart. 4.0. It does your blood oxygen level. It tracks your sleep. The charger is faster than I remember it the is, other one yeah. being. Whoop 4.0 is incredible. If you're not on the Whoop at this point, I mean, you're either just ignoring all of these reads, you're ignore, ignoring every single video we're in that we're wearing. You're ignoring it, your health. You're ignoring your health. It, it's a must have. It says right here, uh, Whoop 4.0 is smaller, smarter, and designed with new biometric tracking, including skin temperature, blood oxygen, and a new haptic alarm. You go to whoop.com under the code 4, you save 15% at checkout. Um, What's the haptic alarm do? I, I actually... Yeah, I was going to say, I actually haven't used that. And when he said that, I guess if you said shakes the alarm, haptic means it like shakes your wrist. It vibrates. To wake vibrates. you up? Vibrates. Instead of being up? like the annoying iPhone alarm? So to wake you up or maybe even to like get you active or something? I think you, to, you, you, dude, I think it's to wake you up because at the end what of... What does haptic mean? It's like vibration. Okay. Um, Is that right? It's like it's... Um, How confident look, are you? Give me a percentage. Uh, 85. Okay. I, I'm a, but every night, right before I go to bed, the, the bar that usually is the health monitor down there, it says set alarm, and I don't do it because I thought it was just going to be like, rah, rah, rah. Well, it, it'll say it down there. Today. Is that what you're a little it'll, tired? It'll be, yeah. It'll be, um, I'm at 50-something because we had a couple cocktails last night, full disclosure. Uh, I, that's interesting. I might start using that haptic alarm. My blood oxygen right now, 97%. Thank you. Whoop. Um, resting heart rate, 54. It'd be nice if it was a little lower, but that's pretty good. 54. Haptic is relating to the sense of touch, in particular relating to the perception and manipulation of objects using the senses of touch. Wow. That's pretty accurate. Kind of, yeah. Whoop.com. Use the code 4. You get 15% off at checkout. The Whoop 4.0. Save 15% off. Whoop.com. Code 4. So how much does Rory love this, loving the stealth? Yeah. Too much. No, <laughs> I feel like he's just been. No, I think he's, he's confident with he's, that he's, thing. He's, 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 I think he's in as good a place as I've ever seen him when it comes to driving the ball and uh, you know feeling like he can do anything in terms of his his natural shot shaping with a driver. It's it's. It, I'm loving it. I don't know what you guys are, but I mean we you know we, we've got talk about the fairways and the drivers there's a there's a lot in play this week man a hell of a lot a lot of those red faces i mean we've probably got 13 staff players in the field it's not a lot so staff players the guys contracts the guys that you pay i mean depending on on how the the five wood long iron situation goes we could have up to a hundred stealth no words in play yeah no so so it's wow that's pe- pe- this is what people then don't, don't notice or well not, not don't notice or see, but but when you're looking at a at a product and you're looking at uh, a credibility and a, and a val- validation of, of the performance of a product, that that for me, is the free like, agents that are that are using I mean, it. the free agents, but but all but they're, they're all this majority of this field would be contracted, so so they're not all free agents. Some of them are just choosing to play. You know, maybe they've got a 10 club deal or 11 right, club right. deal. Right, right. And they find the stealth is the best they, chance they, they, that they have yeah, to the, win. The freedom that they have, they're going that way. Right. Which is, which is cool. Dude, when we were at the Zerk, we were like, oh, I didn't know that guy had a stealth. I didn't know that guy had a stealth. It like was every, staggering. Every uh, tee box we were at, we're like, everybody's got a stealth. At the Phoenix Open, Kevin Chappell was rocking it. Uh, Pat Perez was rocking yeah. it. Not contracted at all. And yeah, they just were all like, I mean, I love this guy. I have to test. And, and there's a, I mean, we, we pride ourselves on at least and at least 50 percent of everything that's free out there should be tailor-made so so half you know there's a lot of brands there's you know six seven eight brands or whatever 
that, that compete for that space and if we can have half of it that's a, it's, a, it's pretty good you know it's pretty measurable so yeah. pretty measurable i'd say pretty, <laughs> i'm obsessed get. with the uh the p770s and i know i believe tiger the three and the two iron are p770s yeah. this week yeah. Does it concern you that he and I are using the same irons? And me, I'm using. And you? The, and me, yeah. So, wow. um, <laughs> I mean, it's it's what what's cool is like in true Tiger style. You know, he's he's got a steel shaft in there. It's in that X100 mid, which <laughs> which has worked out amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's really you know it's something that he's played and felt for a long time. So he he must have immediately gone. That that's exciting. And then you look at the head, right? What is he looking for? He's looking for a little bit of height. He's looking for a little bit of ball speed. Um, and then the ability to hit the Tiger Woods golf shots, which is the stinger and the, and, 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 and the high draws. And you, you watch him on the range yesterday. I mean, what, a, what an intense range session that was. Um, I don't think I saw two, two shots in a row where the tee height was the same or anything. Everything was like versatility, right? And the ball flight was just moving in every window. Were you guys, um, I don't know if you guys were at the, sh at a, at the shoot where, where they did the... Where they had all the pit, all the glass windows. Mm. Did you ever see that we video? Seen it on seen video it. We've seen it on video. So, so, we were not there. So, watching that was like watching your Tiger yesterday on the range was like watching him on that day. Oh God! And like I'm awesome. literally standing behind him, right? And and we've got you know you've got DJ, you've got DJ, you've got Tommy, you've got Matt Wolf, you've got Colin. Um, all of our, I mean, there must have been about eight of our guys on the range there, and he was an assassin. He just, he picked a player and there was like nine windows for that player's face and he just picked him off one no at a problem. time. And at the end it was, it was him and, it was him and Matt Wolf, I think. I don't know, whoever it was, but, but the guy that he was playing against was right on the other end. So his face was like, like, <laughs> yeah. like down there and he just like looked there and just literally nine windows, right? Every shot. And, and I feel like with that 770, um, he's loving it. And it's not like he's got it this week, right? I mean, he was, you know, we, we, were, we, we had information and we had feedback weeks ago that when he was guys, loving this, that, he was, yeah. that he, was, he was playing it and he was loving it. And, and that spec, I mean, obviously we sent him a lot of options and that was where he settled. But I am thinking the fact that it's a two and a three is, is impressive. When you guys get that feedback and that information, do they send you the actual data or is it more just they're sending you their thoughts? So, so depending on who it is right so tiger's not going to send data he's just going to tell you what he's feeling and okay. what he's thinking and, and rob you know rob who, who's who's, yeah, a, yeah. who's tiger's right hand man i mean our guy he couldn't i mean he is literally the best human being he's in amazing the world, isn't yeah, he? he's perfect um, he's a perfect man yeah so for him and whether it's a driver of three wood whatever it is when rob comes to you with feedback and he's very clued up with the equipment He'll he'll talk like Tiger. It's Tiger Woods talking through Rob. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, I like this. You know, I remember with this with the driver. I mean, that was what we sent end of last year. We sent the stealth driver to Tiger. Was before that that uh, father son event. Uh, the driver wasn't even on the the list yet, right? We we were still waiting to push it out, and 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 it, the feedback was. This is go time. Were you? <laughs> this is going in. Were you? When you in. showed up with it at the PNC. Did you know that he was going yes, to? Yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah. So you yeah, didn't yeah. turn on TV like, oh, yeah. he's using no, it. no, no, Let's that was away. everybody Let's else. That was away. everybody <laughs> else. <laughs> launch, launch, yeah, launch. Yeah, yeah right, right. <laughs> launch. Hit, hit the hit the button. Yeah. Go, 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 those, go. Turn those machines on. <laughs> Minions are all running around. <laughs> what uh, is this? We credit card process. We need double. Yeah, right. Unbelievable. Yeah. So I've told this story on the podcast, I think, before, but. <laughs> I, I couldn't keep it. Oh, no. I, the enemy. I just He's the worst. I, 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 I got so excited. I got so excited. I don't know. I don't know what was happening. He can't contain I himself. Con I, I did. I was did. like, I, I didn't see nothing. Oh. I, he came in that. What was he gonna do? Pants you? I don't know. <laughs> we'll <laughs> never know. So Kevin Kisser was coming up behind me. Then. Dewey, Dewey's barely making it down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, tell me that. He gave us Snickers bars yesterday. Yeah, we're not dogging him. Fucking love that guy. Out of way, Dwayne. There you go, Dwayne. I'm coming. He says. I love you. I'm coming. Tough major. This you really gave that away. Oh, but I know. It's so easy. I saw kids just like gave me, you know, shh. I was just he like, didn't oh. give me the shit. Was he going to tabletop me? You guys don't remember doing that? That was really, when people tabletop people, it's super mean. Speaking of uh, Taylor made athletes, Tommy Flea was wearing an there outrageous is, outfit man. today. He's got the green, the blue. He can pull it off, though. Adrian, what do you think of that outfit? I think he pulls off anything. He yeah. does. He, he really does. Really does. Cool factor, he's cool. He? So now, Adrian, a guy like Tommy, he's got all the skill in the world, obviously. I mean, you wouldn't call it like a. 
whatever you want to call yeah. where his game's at right now. Yeah. Is he the type of guy that's like constantly coming to the truck and trying to figure out why things are happening and how he can change things up? Like, are you working more with a guy like him than you are a guy like Scotty? Who's like just got things rolling right now? Sure, I mean he's he's playing well. He's he's trending well, and if you look right. at, um, he's probably more settled now than than, he, than he's been in okay. the last twelve months, which is great. Um, I would say that he, you know, he's he's more of like a deep thinker. He kind of analyzes a little bit more than than, than most guys, um, and very patient, very patient. So so uh, you know the fact that he's trending, like when I say trending, I mean statistically. He's, you know, he's, he's he's playing like a top twenty player in the world now, right? Um, which is great. Which means, you know what I mean? A, a good week on the greens, or a, you know, just just a little bit of a little bit of fortune going his way, and he's gonna he's gonna be in the mix and have a chance. Right. Um, he plays hard golf courses very well because his his iron plays so good. And when you talk about like Shinnecock, a sec- baby, you talk about a second shot golf course and 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 uh, you know an iron player that is. You know, it, it was it, so. It, it, can't tell. Talk, we were talking about Tiger so much, and you know, like he, he he was actually he actually hit Tiger's irons before Tiger. Ooh. Yeah. Really. Yeah. It, which really? Was, uh, yeah, I, a, a few years back, he was um, he was obviously deep. He was in Nike irons, and he was deeply searching for a fresh set. The irons were kind of so worn, and he kind of gave us all a shot at finding him some irons. Um, huh. And and, and, it's and Tiger's iron wasn't fully cooked yet. You right. know what I mean? Look, Tiger was still designing it, but <laughs> fully but, cooked is a good term. But you got you, you know what I mean? You still got, in the kitchen. You, you got a player like that, and you've got one crack at him, and you've got one, uh, you've got like a, a sweet store of, of equipment, but you you can only take him one or two options. So you, being smart, uh, we took him that one yeah. because it was it was his DNA, right? Oh, mate, it was amazing. It was amazing. Nobody had a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody had a chance. Is it, a... is it nerve-wracking when you, when you make a club for someone and then they're on the range hitting it and you, they're just directly judging it, basically? Yeah, straight away. And then if it's a, if it's a bigger player, you've got, you got people around and crowds around. Right. We try to do a lot of work like off like off site yep. with the, with the, with the big guys but but then you got guys preparing for tournaments so there's a lot that goes on on site I always think of the scene in in uh in Star Wars where they're standing there with Darth Vader and they're like don't worry they're chasing the Millennium Falcon and they're like don't worry we disabled the hyperspeed and he's like no problem the thing just takes off at hyperspeed Darth Vader just like looks at him like <laughs> what the fuck was that yeah <laughs> i feel like that on the range of like they hit it doesn't come off a certain way and they're just kind of like uh they're like looking to you basically yeah yeah you do get it's it gotta be that. weird so you always like try to take a couple of options yeah 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 you know, most of the time you know you have you can predict what's gonna happen but your your plan b needs to be pretty ready because you're not gonna have much time if you if let's say he hits it the ball flight's perfect but there's like a feel thing or, or a or a um you know, a sound thing or that, that, that the player's uncomfortable with, you've got to make sure that you have a, an answer for the next, and next they, hit. And they know their numbers and their feels so well. I mean, he's not a tailor made athlete, but Kevin Kisner were behind him. Yeah, he almost pants great, rigs. But he was... You blew it. He, I did blow it. He was um, <laughs> hitting like a bunch of drivers yesterday on the range, and they, they were giving him maybe three or four different driver heads. And I'm like, imagine having such a dialed-in swing that every single swing is so consistent that your manufacturer and your team can figure out the difference between lofts and degrees yeah. and shafts. Like yeah. for us, we got fitted, we went to the TaylorMade Kingdom, it's amazing. It definitely helped us in our game. Yeah. But like swing one to swing 15 can't be the same for me as it is for Kevin but, Kisner or Scotty Scheffler. Well, you say that, but there, it actually, you, do, you will have, we would call it like, like a fingerprint. So although you might not be as consistent in terms of delivering the club face in it, in a in a really tight tolerance way your your dna your your swing fingerprint would we will be and we've proven that you have proven we've it. proven that yeah. i didn't and know that, the science behind math, it but that's the math system yeah so so you wow the, the, what whoever you are you will you will repeat to like a certain degree which is very high percentage unless you, wow. and, you know you're going through lessons and you kind of start to trying to shift and change what you're doing you, you know you but 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 if you just i just got you there and i told you to hit if i told you to hit hit me 10, 10 shots right we took all the data um, and we put it on, on, on an avatar like a math system 
uh, motion capture gear system and we put those 10 swings over each other like we morphed them together you'd be amazed at how consistent they would be wow that's really so interesting every golfer that's good to know because yeah. every golfer regardless of skill has a fingerprint where it's like which a general is, swing 100 regardless of how many swings you wow you can fit it wow huh. you can, and, 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 how and many what, do you need to like get a confident fingerprint basically how many swings well probably one one Jesus. no what i'm saying is like, is say like i know the next one's going to be similar but then you, you know if you've got 10 15 20 seven irons and and then we started to analyze where you kind of break it down right now now we're looking at let's just look at club face and your club face could range from let's say two or three degrees left to two or three degrees right that's a six degree gap it's huge but whereas tommy's might be one to one and a half degrees right. in the right direction so his consistency is really there so 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 our job with a with a consumer or fitting you would be to try and get that tolerance better through equipment through forgiveness through you know we can look at patterns at where you hit it on the face next year we got to do the morph thing we never did the morph. Oh, we got to do the morph gear thing. system man oh we want to do the Mark, gear system okay Michael Neff, gear system. looking at mike in the background he's writing it down, down. <laughs> we want to do that's the gear a fake that. file that you're writing that down thing. and there's no text, way he's a, a snapchat or something that is <laughs> that also, there's no way that you wrote quickly, anything down there i quickly want to give a shout out to tommy fleawood yeah we're talking about he's going down this whole line Given I'm bad at estimating numbers. He signed 150 I autographs. He's the only guy I've seen yeah. do the entire. Wow, line. they've got all right. Frankie head cover. gears. So shout Tom. out to Tommy Fleetwood. He's just I, he, that's got, his that's the class act right there. They've got all right, Frankie gear over there, Tom, and he might think it's for his. Come over here. He might <laughs> think it's for his son. See, his son's name is Frankie. And he's like, no, I'm finishing this line. Which I Come on, did. Scotty. Holy, there you go, Scotty. Way to go, kid. <laughs> that boy, Teddy. Man, Scotty Shepard locked yelling at everybody. in. It's yeah. Wednesday before well, he's major. He's ready to go, man. Guy is ready to go. Number one player in the world. Coming off a Masters win. Jeez, that guy's good. Going to the range at, at 2 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. Have you ever seen down. it? And I'm sure the answer is obviously yes. I mean, Tiger Woods exists. But have you ever seen a guy work as hard as that guy? Because when he, when we were at the Ryder Cup, he putted for... Three hours? Three hours after a practice like round. Tuesday night, Wednesday because night. Because he, fig he figured out that one of his putters were a little bit off or whatever. He could, and he would, he refused yeah. to stop working until he figured out the putt. I mean, that guy really? is built different. Yeah. Even in, in, a, in an environment where everyone's built different, he's built even more different. American superstar, man. It's true. American superstar. How thrilled are you guys with him? Oh, man. And we, uh, mm. we, we had put in so much work with him to, you know, to get his trust and acquire him to tailor made. Yep. And, you know, we, we had things locked up with him way before he won uh, in Phoenix. And, and, like, the thing was, like, everybody would say, like, oh, wow, what timing was that? You signed him, and then he went on and won three or four times. But in, in, in reality, you know, we had, the work was done. And you guys we, knew. We, we, were just, we were just crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And, you know, here he comes. See, what a man. Tommy Fleetwood. And yeah, he signed more autographs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, giving us a lot of good information. Hey, you think anybody else in this group could pull off that outfit you got on right now? I can't what? even pull it off. Oh yeah, you can. No, we just had a full <laughs> discussion about it. You can. Good, yeah. We uh, yeah. yeah. Looking at my ass. I am. <laughs> we were, so many we were giving, all we could see. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I just, well, the only reason we could see us because you face. you did this whole autograph line. We were giving you a shout out. Actually, yeah. do you know what? Funnily enough, uh, my caddy was just speaking. and He said that Trent is really shit at golf. What? He did yeah. What's happening? It's not untrue. They um. Said trends crap at golf. <laughs> 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 so, they, they, don't, they don't believe me. <laughs> He's seen some really bad golf shots. That's true. John that, Tillery. They don't believe me that you hit. He's got. A, he's got his hands before full. he did. I just had a Tiger's hands before he did. Yeah. I mean, uh, probably not enough. <laughs> really? Yeah. He did. Yeah, at Riviera one year. He said, "How did you?" <laughs> like he looked in my bag and he was like, "How did you get those?" We were playing, yeah. you know that Japan tournament that Tiger won? Yeah. Um, Zozo. So Tiger, Tiger comes off the course, he's, 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 just, he's just played, he's played with, he played with you that way. And he's just played unbelievable. He's come off and done a clinic for a whole crowd of people, the best clinic I've ever seen. And uh, one, one reporter asks him about his irons and, you know, how he, you know, talk us through it. And the first thing he says is, Tommy Fleetwood actually had a set before me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know you had it's it. Clear, if, I mean, if it's all I achieve in my golf career, then it's, 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 it's going That's well, good. Right? It's good. <laughs> it's amazing. Perfect, man. Right. Thanks, buddy. Right. Thanks. Have a good yeah. week. Yeah. Good to see you, Best Tommy. of luck this week, Tommy. Yeah.
Yeah. <laughs> Ass looks nice. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy Fleetwood, the most interesting man in golf. He's just amazing. What, 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 a, what, a, what a human being, man. He's so great. But, He's yeah. just cool. He's got a, a, a level of cool, I feel like, that not yeah. many people carry. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm going to stay up tonight thinking about what this guy is for that's sure. He yeah. uses cool. Just what I see. Without trying. <laughs> yeah. so he's not trying. <laughs> what cool. I see. He's <laughs> smart everywhere, wouldn't he? How about his, his caddy? What's his, what's his boy's Ian name? Finnis. Yeah, he buried Trent. Finnis. He goes, you yeah. suck at golf. Finnis. And he goes, it's what I see. <laughs> just yeah. like, okay. I mean, over. I mean, I know I'm not. I know. I know. I did a Breaking 100 series. We're doing Breaking 90 We never claimed to be good. Uh, Never. But, but now you look at like what a duo, right? You got Fino and, and Tommy and uh, best mates, and they grew up. I mean, how do it's you? Awesome. How do you? Where those two end up getting matched yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Where'd wow. you meet? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. No, his uh, his boy, his caddy is um, comments on a lot of our stuff actually. Really? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, he's he loves he one of the yeah, trolls. Yeah, he's no, no. Okay. Well, golf it might nuts. come off the wrong way because you know they got both of them really from he's, across he's, the pond. It's a, Think it's of where they met. It's a humor. It's a dry sense of humor that we love. He's, he's as honest as they come straight up, and that's probably how they, they... They're both absolute golf nerds, nuts, everything. So that's that's why they, they're well, probably best We were at the Zurich Classic, and we would go up to Tommy right before we played in this, like, that shootout thing that we were doing, yeah. uh, where we were hitting on the range. And we go up to Tommy, and we're like, we're nervous as shit. And he goes, go to someone else with your problems. <laughs> it's like, I can't like, help you. It came off so funny. <laughs> but, like, to other people, I mean, like, some people might think, like, oh, that was super rude. But we're dying laughing because you know his humor. He's such dry humor. Yeah. God, he's the Shop best guy ever. Well. Yeah. yeah, super sharp. So witty. Um, awesome. We've noticed that. One of our biggest takeaways being, you know, now more uh, uh, involved and around is how you would think that a lot of the players, caddies, et cetera, would be sick of talking about golf for the most part all they want to do is talk about golf oh, they, they think about golf all day Eat, sleep, golf drink, nerds. Golf. you know harry higgs is another mm-hmm. terrormate athlete you know we had him on the podcast uh, during uh, media week when we were out yeah. in florida and you know we had him on for like an hour and 45 minutes and harry higgs obviously has the image the brand he's got no buttons he's taking his shirt off but man we got into like for an hour and 15 minutes of it it was hardcore golf oh. down to the science and he yeah. loved it or like I think a lot of people on site, a lot of the like personnel, the equipment guys on site here, yeah, players, you have to, it's 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 a lifestyle, right? Think of it like you know, a, 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 call it a soccer player or a football football player. They they go they co- they go they train. The time spent doing it is 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 a lot less than a, a golfer who turns up on a Monday, finishes on a Sunday, turns up on a Monday, right. finishes on a Sunday, yeah. turns up on a Monday. It's nonstop. So, so as a as a passion. I mean, we, we love it. I mean, I go, like, my boss and my colleagues, my team in Europe, if we go to dinner, we, you know, we're here all day, we go to dinner in the evening, maybe we've got a player or some agents. What are we talking about? Golf, golf. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, and, and it's like, you, you never run out of things t- to talk about because every day is so different and everyone's trying something unique and new. It's just an addiction. Golf's an addiction. I mean, last night we had an event under the lights across the street at La Fortune. We had a Tulsa Tango. And Max Homer just showed up, and I'm thinking to myself, like, it's Caddy played. Mm-hmm. It's Caddy played. I'm like, man, aren't these guys golfed out? This guy's got a major this week, and he's just like sitting there in just like shorts and t shirt, just holding the wedge and just like watching yeah, golf. He's cool, like, what else am I going to cool do? I'm just sitting in my hotel. Time, like, yeah. I don't know. I love this. Yeah, I love this cool thing. Way to pause time. So that's, and they're pretty good at it. That, that's it's pretty, pretty good. good. I mean, we got a lesson level. out of him last night. Yeah. <laughs> Next level, how good Next they level. are. You got a little lesson out of Max? Bunker lesson. So we were in. The, so we were deciding it was a scramble, and Trent and I had missed the green for like the first time. We were actually striping the ball, but Trent put one in a bunker. There I put were whispers one. around property it how was good crazy. you guys were hitting it. Oh, Probably the best. Going into a par three ter- course, you would think that Trent and I would be the worst combo of all time because wedges and everything. Yeah. And we, we were two under through 11 holes. It was like, we were playing oh, wow. well. It was like, I have oh, the um, stealth irons going in my bag. Stealth I, irons in the bag. He's dude, loving them. He's I love them. The shit out of them. I've never hit the ball better. Anyway, he, he was in one bunker. I was on the other side of the green. And some like, it was a short-sided pin. So it was kind of a tough chip. I decided, I was like, we should go for the chip because Trent's the worst bunker player on the planet. No offense to John Tillery or you. Mm. But, um, and then every, Max is like, what are you, crazy? You have like a perfect lie in this bunker and you have all this room to run it out. So we yeah. choose a bunker. At La Fortune Golf Club, they're all like, hard pan bunkers yeah. it's not this fluffy stuff out here and i was sure. like nervous about it going in he didn't help me out on the shot but he was going to give me a lesson after basically said so i thought with such a hard pan almost like hitting off concrete i thought you almost attack it like a wedge like a wedge shot off of like a tight lie where you just nip it underneath because yeah. i'm thinking to myself like i can't go down because it, it's just hard and after we both sculled it 150 feet off over the green, <laughs> legitimately 150 feet over the green, as it was. he got into the bunker and he's just like, no, dude, you're completely wrong. Opposite. On that. What a game it's, of opposites. Yes. Yeah. Game of opposite. He yeah. goes, 
everything you have on your front foot yeah. and as hard as you can you're driving into the ground get the leading edge you have into, to get the yeah. leading edge yeah. in because if you think about it like hitting off concrete it's going to try it's going to bounce yeah. and hit the center equator of the golf ball and you're going to go flying out that it's way it's called a knoth that's it there you go <laughs> exactly was, yeah sure is so it couldn't have been more of a it i just needed been... to hear that actually because my least favorite shot in golf is when you get into a bunker especially a lot of public yeah. courses we play where they're not perfect conditions yeah. fine but when it is hard pan, yep. I have no option other than just blade it 100 yards over. So we, I don't I, have another I shot. Asked him, I'm like, when are you ever in this situation? He's like, dude, you'd be surprised because even at Southern Hills, it's a little bit firmer than we're used to. Yeah. He said these you bunkers. Feel, and, uh, I guess that's why you got to you got to move your you feet. Go right, in, I didn't know they did the that surface. to test the surface. Yeah, there you go. You know how deep it is. Yes. You know how much that's bounce crazy. you need to use. Frankie goes, what are you, Aladdin? Whenever the people say, <laughs> yeah, that, the man. Pocahontas, one with the earth and the wind. I just do it because everybody else does it. I do it because I always do it because I know you do this. Oh yeah. Just so they have something to rake when they're out of it. You know what I mean? They come over, you just you went through the bot. It's just like, <laughs> what are my you? knees. Is yeah, oh, just go. good? Just good? Yeah, no, it's deep. It's Do deep. I look like I know what I'm doing? You're holding, it at, like the, <laughs> you're holding like, it at the hosel. Yeah. Uh, now, Trent, you're in there, pal. Uh, but, yeah, I thought that was a pretty cool little lesson. I, I never thought of it that way. But it's, are, it's also a, a look. These guys are insanely good. It's a glaring look into how much they know about the game compared to us. So we had much. the complete opposite approach. Well, Adrian, look, we appreciate it. Uh, we took a ton of your time. Tommy said, I think you've been over there for three hours with these guys. So <laughs> is you're he, golf is nut. he saying We're you're a little bit nuts. of a diva? Is that why? No, no. <laughs> he just needs my attention. You know what I mean? He's like, why is he giving, why is somebody else getting <laughs> yeah, attention? Right. Jealous. Yeah, yeah, he's not going to be fitting them. That's what he's thinking. Yeah, he's right, he's right, an attention right. seeker over there. That's right. <laughs> he wants to dial in in his degrees right <laughs> now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we appreciate it. Big week for the TaylorMade athletes. We got the number one um, ranked player uh, in the world. We have the Needle, the biggest uh, name in the history of golf, TaylorMade athlete. We got Rory, who you were giggling about. Yeah. You're so confident in him. Crazy, so. crazy. The vibes. Tommy I was Fleetwood. We got awesome. a lot of hot action for our guys this week. So we appreciate the time. Appreciate I imagine, you know, coming up the uh, Open Championship, we'll probably have to go back to our major championship equipment consultant. Absolutely, man. And I appreciate you guys having me on. And it's fun. It really is fun. The future. Future. Not historic. Not Ooh. historic. Your shoes <laughs> are awesome, by the way, That's, too. Yeah, I think Nikes are. are sick. i got a nice friend at Nike, man. I'll give him a shout out. He he sends these are specific, special for this week. They, so he, yeah, he, he calls me up Monday, he says, you're going to get something Thursday in the post. Will you please wear them next week? Like, Those yeah, are I'll amazing. Anything, anything that's free, I'll wear. You got like kind of a clean swagger about you. Of course, it's not flashy. Yeah, it's not flashy, yeah, it's not flashy <laughs> but it's if you really dig deep, you're like, okay, Those are nice too. this guy's putting some effort in. <laughs> yeah, Thank the G4. You, yeah, right, thanks for the time. Cheers. Right, thanks, Thank you, Adrian. Appreciate Cheers. you. Cheers. <laughs> Adrian is the man. Taylor May Golf is the company. They are the best. And um, we're about to get now to from the gallery, which there may be a bit going on, unintentional bit, where I say we have a bunch of from the galleries to get to, and then. We talk ourselves um, basically off cliffs and never get to it. We are actually going to get to a couple from the galleries. And from the galleries, actually brought to you by our friends at Truly Hard Seltzer, which it's, it's summertime. It's hot. We've made that very clear. It's hot in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's going to be hot in Scottsdale, Arizona. Truly Hard Seltzer is one of the great refreshing drinks to enjoy on a golf course, at a pool, on a boat, at a bar, wherever you may be. You can visit trulyhardseltzer.com and find out where it is near you. Every can, okay, every can has under 110 calories, one gram of sugar, and naturally gluten-free, so no gluten, without gluten, sans gluten. Uh, and then they have over 30 flavors, so there's something for everyone. They got their new margarita flavors, which are awesome. Their fruit punch flavors, which I think is what Frankie was trying to get to last time. No, there's a kiwi one I was telling you about. I got a Ooh. lot of messages about it. There's a new kiwi. I don't know what their name is. I don't know if it's like the party mix or something. There's a name for them, but... Everyone's been sending it to me. There's a new kiwi flavor out there. It's wild. It's mm. got a crazy little can with a kiwi splashing into some vodka. Okay. It's cool. Okay. So go get yourself some Truly Hard Seltzer. They got over 30 flavors. They got a little bit for everybody. Wild Berry is probably my favorite. OG, the Blueberry Acai. I believe that's my father, Steve. Uh, his favorite is the Blueberry Acai. We're going to be at Mesa Country Club in uh, in the Mesa, Arizona, which is right near Scottsdale and Phoenix on Monday and Tuesday. Drinking Truly Hard Seltzers, they're the official sponsor, title sponsor of the Barstool Classic. But do yourself a favor, gra grab yourself a Truly. You're going to love it if you haven't tried them. I don't know what rock you've been living under, but congratulations for getting out from underneath it and try yourself some Truly and find Truly Hard Seltzer near you at trulyhardseltzer.com. Uh, a couple of these from the galleries really quickly. The first one have is... You guys, hold on. Have yeah. you guys seen the movie The Replacements? Yeah. Yep. Um, oh, God, it's been so long, though. Keanu Reeves, yeah. John Favreau. Yeah. Um, in that movie... A guy pukes on the ground and they move the huddle mm -hmm. away from the puke. Okay. Could we do something similar 
okay. out of the sun yeah, yeah, right you're now. In the sun. I just I, I don't want to I don't want to stand because it it's already hot enough outside, and I just didn't want to stand directly in the sun because we've got this beautiful shade under this tree. Is this better? I feel Ryan? way better right okay. now. Right, so good. I appreciate you guys doing that. That was the only way I could bring it up. It's a great Anything movie. Else you guys it's want a good movie. Real quick. No, it's a great movie. I, I like, like that movie. Blake from Vancouver. Um, what's up? What was that? <laughs> Brendan Jones, what did you just say? Blake Nakagawa. Yeah. Love Blake. Eight-year-old Blake, who's probably 10 or 11 now. Um, what? We got to do a video of Blake. You know Blake, the little Hawaiian oh, kid? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that him that did the thing? No, oh, this guy's this from, is Vancouver. from Vancouver. Hawaii, right? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, Blake Nakagawa, I believe his name is. Kids can fucking stripe it. Yeah, he's good. And the, the, his sister's really good, too. It's crazy. The family doesn't mess around. Shout out to Blake. Love this. Shout out to Blake. Sorry for cursing. Earmuffs. Blake from Vancouver. Has oh. Tiger ever listened to the pod? Nope. Nope. I think nope as well. Nope, but definitely has been told about some things that were said on it. You got to hear these guys, bunch of idiots. I bet he's been shown a social clip from the pod. 100%. Yeah. Clips. Well, yeah. Dude, Robbie Mac knows every time we blade a fucking wedge. And it, like, whenever our like big videos go viral on a social on social media, he sees them. Did we put the audio of you and him at the match into the podcast? Because he, yes. he definitely heard that. You think so? Because he was there. Yeah, but the, I mean, okay, you're right. That audio he consumed in real time right. with me standing right next yeah, to him. He's definitely been told about. No, that. He's yeah, but it, has he ever it. sat down and no. like on Spotify or iTunes or whatever and been like, four play pod? No, nope, never. But None vi- of them. zero podcast. The clips that go crazy for sure. Like that, that to me seems like something Robbie Mac like sort of feeds a little bit of information here and there to Tiger. It, it has to go across Robbie Mac's desk before it gets to Tiger Woods' face. That's right. Agreed. Eyes, ears. There's no doubt. Caleb, not Caleb Presley, I don't think. Uh, in your lifetime while driving, have you passed more cars or been passed by more cars on the road? I've passed more cars. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a passer. You're a fast driver? You're a thrill seeker? Uh, no, 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 not like that, but I just, I know, I can just picture it, and I'm very rarely, like, stagnant in the right lane. And I do the right thing where I pass on the left and I and then, then you I move back get over back to the right. I'm not an me asshole. Me too. But, like, I'm definitely always kind of on the move. I'm going to say for me it's close. Okay. And the reason I'm not an aggressive driver, but I, no. you know, on, I've done a lot of road trips, you know, and, and you know, you pass a lot on road trips. Not that many. I feel like because you're kind of, you're, you're, you're always pushing the envelope a little bit. You're like, if the speed limit's 65, you're right at, like, 72, mm-hmm. not quite at, like, 77 because that's 12 over. You might get a ticket. 77 or 8 over, you're not going to get a ticket. So I feel like you're kind of in that, but you're buzzing by people. You know what has kind of changed 50, this, 50. too? is gps where they'll put yeah, up true. the time of arrival on your screen mm-hmm. it'll say you're gonna get there at 7 18 p.m it's a contest it's like, but we can get there at 6 45 <laughs> it's a contest and you're pass not, more people and you're not yeah i agree and you're not like but then where are the people that have been passed no i pass lot? way more people there's a lot of instances i can think back to number one being long island expressway going into the queen's midtown tunnel there's a bunch of sheep that wait on the left three lanes and the right lanes for buses only and every single morning that thing fucking piles up. And this will come back to haunt me at some point. I'm sure I can get a ticket just for talking about this. But, you know, you just so happen to like, oh, I missed the sign. And you just ride the right lane. You pass 10,000 cars every <laughs> morning. I mean, every morning. I mean, it, it makes your commute from an hour and a half to 45 minutes. It's crazy. I also And you're just like, you always get into the left lane when you see, you get like over one lane when you see someone maybe texting and they didn't realize that everyone moved ahead of them. You sneak right in there. It's a fucking grind. But I've you've never all. been the one texting that like a bunch of cars just flew by yeah, you on the dude, left? Yeah, but dude, I've done that way too much and I'm just, I'm a go, I go, I go. I, I, I couldn't have been get like I've never been in the instance where someone was beating me to that right lane move. I don't know that I... I've always been the guy to try and get in that move. I'm definitely past 20 times more people than I've been past. 20x, wow. Dude, it's... I'm I'm just wondering where all the people are then that are being passed all the time. I think maybe it could be... It might come down to population and age. Uh, Do you age into the right lane? Like, when you get older, you become less... You definitely age into you don't give a fuck about anyone else on the road. And that uh, that makes me think. Then you go into the right lane. And you're just like, I'm gonna just cruise in the right lane. Turn to a Q-tip, and you just. We've stay got in the a right lane. like. We've got. We've got. We got young blood a little bit, and we're still kind of like, let's go, let's pass, let's let's. So you think, Birch you know, tried to pass one car in a one lane road, two lane road, opposite directions, and it's like you're not supposed to pass cars there, and he tried to, 
and we almost got fucking decked by a truck. He's an irresponsibly dangerous driver. Yeah, he makes <laughs> yeah. horrible decisions. Really yeah. bad. He is, man. He doesn't focus the way you're supposed to focus. He thinks it's like a game, like you're playing a video game. That is, what is it, top five cause of death in America? It's got to be up there. Is it like automobile accidents? I think I'm. I think I'm a, a more past cars, but maybe that's what people. But you're saying then. But you're saying, and I think that I'm in that boat as well. But what you're saying is, by the time, as you get closer to 85 years old, you're saying you think it starts to even out. Yeah. You start to get past more and more, and it yeah, gets closer to zero. Like right now, I I still think like I I got I got somewhere to be. I got to get there. I got to go there now. I think as you age and you get a little bit more perspective, it's like we we'll get there when we get there. Yeah. So that's JJ Spawner over there, huh? So JJ Spawn, I had a good incident with JJ Spawn today. I walked over and I saw him on the putting green with. Uh, stand over here. Yeah. yeah, I saw him on the putting green with uh, uh, Joel what, Damon. First of all, what tournament did he win? He was the one right before like the Masters. A week or two before the Masters, um, maybe the week before the Masters. Oh, it was at the. Uh, uh, um, it was in Texas, right? The Valero. The Valero. Yes. Texas yeah, Open. That's what it was. Um, can we confirm that in case he comes over here? So we oh, wait, sounds so like we know what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, JJ, go get him, baby. Let's go, JJ. Come on, man. <laughs> the miscommunication. So he just he just flicked off Frankie he Brilliant. Fucked, he fucking flicked me off. No, he doesn't, he doesn't like you. He's not kidding. Bro, it was a miscommunication. All right. So here's what happened. Let me explain. You want the, you, explain. You want the I got to explain my side. So I walk over. Valero Tech's open. He won that? Yes. JJ Spawn, great player. Awesome off, emotional dude. victory. So the week before the Masters, he wins Damn. the Valero Tech's open to get into the field in the Masters. Uh, we're doing a podcast, and that's going to come up in a second. What came up before that was this afternoon. I'm walking onto the course. I see Joel Damon. I go over. He's playing a practice round with J.J. Spawn. I'm chit-chatting, ke- catching up, whatever. J.J. Spawn comes over from the green, and he goes, um, oh, yeah, like, which one? Somebody from your show say uh, I'd be lucky to, if I could hold the door open for Tiger Woods at the Masters? And I immediately was just threw Frankie right on the bus. I was like, yeah, yeah, that had to be Frankie. And I started to kind of think in my head in real time, like, what the fuck did we say? Because I don't know what we say on the show. And I started to be like, you know what? We were talking about Tiger returning and how that just dominates every storyline it doesn't matter and then somehow Frankie I believe said something along the lines of like oh yeah who like JJ Spawn just won a tournament he came and hold the fucking door open for Tiger Woods this week that. but the context behind it is so that he does not like he, and they called me and then he goes what's up pizza boy that's what he said <laughs> and then, and then, Jake loved that and then he fucking <laughs> flipped me off just now so we got a he said it loud too the, the pizza boy thing Frankie oh, Riggs was, was talking to him and Frankie and I were a little bit behind and we were walking I think what was that the 18th hole here at Southern Hills <laughs> Yeah. and he just Frankie and I were walking up we're probably 50 feet away and he goes hey pizza boy and, and it's like, good I, you know I, I need that it's like it's a humbling experience I need to be knocked down a few pegs we're talking about Tiger Woods earlier this week we gotta get knocked we down we gotta get knocked down a few pegs I'm the first person to admit I am a fucking loser out here. So if JJ Spawn wants to like, you know, shit on me a little bit, then he has every right to. I want him to know. <laughs> I got something in my mouth. I want him to know <laughs> that when we were talking about, it, there's audio confirming this. I was saying that because Tiger Woods is playing in the Masters, it's such a big story that like the dude that just won the Valero after I mean, he had an insane amount of starts before he even won a tournament. It was like That was his first win. It was like hundred and ninety five starts or something like that. Won the fucking Valero. I'm like, it's and then he got into the Masters by only winning the Valero. I'm like, that's the best storyline of a regular tournament going into that week every other week, except for the Masters when Tiger Woods is playing. I got something in my mouth. And um Tiger Woods winning makes this guy like the doorman. You know what I mean? Like the guy who usually is the biggest story. Shout out to JJ for winning a tournament because I watched him win that tournament. I watched that tournament being like, oh, fuck, that's awesome. Even that guy couldn't hold the door open for the guy that's about to play and barely make the cut. You know what I mean? Like that's how big Tiger Woods is. Here's what happens. Fuck you, JJ. (laughs) Here's what happens. You know what happens? And this has happened to you before with Abraham, Abraham Answer at the President's Cup. When you start getting riled up about Tiger, it, we just start saying stuff. Sure. And you were you said you wanted Tiger to end yeah, Abraham you Answer's career. It. You start slinging. Which well, is, I still want Tiger was to have Abraham beat Abraham Answer so badly that he never wants to play the game of golf. Right. That's how much I love Tiger Woods. And I think in that are moment, we not allowed to have fan, like are we not allowed to root for our fucking guys? No, but you got to be ready for JJ Spawn's going to hear that. He's going to give you the finger and call you pizza I boy. I still right. gave him. It was like a, it was <laughs> like a it was it was a <laughs> not a backhanded compliment. I guess it was. It's a backhanded compliment where you're like, hey, congratulations on winning. Compliment. It wasn't it's, a compliment. It is, I see what you're saying where you're I saying. Was, I was like, it, that was complimentary be, of how well he played the week like, before, man, how awesome should, of a story it should be. It should be the biggest story, but you got fucking big dick Eldrick walking through that door. That's not that bad of, that's not that bad of a comment. He probably heard it in a different way, J.J. Spawn, yeah. I would imagine. It's all right. That's a funny little rivalry. You oh. always get caught in these things. That's fine. 
That's fine. We'll have him on the show one day and have him call you Pizza Boy, and it'll be fun. I thought we were going to have him over it. there for a second. I thought I, it was going to be fun, and he, he flicked me, Frankie he, off and just walked away. <laughs> we're at the PJ Territory. That's insane. <laughs> no, it's nuts. I mean, I deserve it. There's no doubt I about respect it. it. I respect every. it. What's up, buddy? What's up? What's up? How's How it going? You? How are we doing? Good What's going on? Good to see you, man. How's it going? Oh, not doing much. Podcast. We're doing this live podcast. How are you doing? Hey. Not every joint. Sweating my tits off right now. Yeah, you are. It's hot out here. Yeah, you're hot out here. Do you know what time it's supposed to get hot? All Not day. yet. Is this live for real? Well, no, no, it's recorded, recorded but, it, but live to tape, I think they say. Rangers? Fuck you. What? I'm an Islanders fan, dude. Islanders. He'll give you one. Well, the Rangers fan. are playing really good. No, no. But that makes okay. me I'm upset. a Blues fan. Makes me Lost sad. last night. How you doing? How are you doing, dude? <laughs> You're sweating mad. They got me doing a sound check right now. I'm just listening. <laughs> There's a lot How is this you. all going, by the way? I did it last week for the Byron. I fucking loved it, dude. You love this? Yeah, it's fun. Uh, it's fun just to, you know. It's fun to get in there. Yeah. Part of the action. I love KH Lee. He's like a, he's a sweetheart. So that was fun. Great quote from him. I want to be the best player in the world, but then I want to be the sexiest person in the world. <laughs> they're, ta- they're talking about Okay. All right. Go do your thing. All right. Go do your thing. Go do your thing. Bye. Oh, there's Matt Every's going to be on the live coverage. He has hey, Joe. ESPN thing on him. Who's Joe's th- co- someone named. Who's calling you? Joe, what's up? You pocket dialing me right now? Joe Griner. Oh, Max caddy Homa's of caddy. Max Homa. Who played in the Tulsa Tango last night. This show's kind of all over the place. Which I think I he love. was just uh, pocket dialed me. Oh, wow. Ooh, you should have listened to that. Well, the thi- uh, yeah, the thing I thought he was going to be like, yeah, I just ran into JJ Spawn. What the hell's going on with Frankie? What's the, uh, <laughs> no, I, see, I got odds on JJ Spawn. He's on the range. I can barely see him because he's so short. You're, oh, see, boy. you're just digging see, yourself I mean, I'm deeper. sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, call me a pizza boy. It's like I'm a fucking. Well, it's I, funny I have, because, okay, five I'm, minutes ago you were like, it's a miscommunication. And now you're like. <laughs> You guys are short little bitch. Excuse me, it's miscommunication. <laughs> I didn't call him bitch. I just said I can barely see him over that fucking grain of rice. All right, all right, all right. In front of him? <laughs> behind him. Behind him? Yeah, because if he's in front, I the, see. the grain of rice would have to be behind him. <sighs> you guys are going to have a reconciliation. We will have one because, yeah. I, you know what? It's one of the only tournaments at, uh, that like wasn't a really big tournament. It was the Valero fucking Texas Open okay. that I sat there and watched and like really got invested in his story. And thought it was cool. And it was before Tiger had committed to the Masters. And I remember writing in a notes app being like, to talk on pod tomorrow, JJ Spawn, cool story. Hundred something starts. So this whole thing's been turned on my head. And now I have to have a rivalry with this guy. It's the only guy I I watched all year. For the record, I love JJ Spawn. I like him too. I'm a huge fan. Big fan of his. Uh, And then he was the the first guy to tee off at the Masters this year. I know a lot about the guy. Yeah, he I was know. in the first group. Seems like you guys are tight. No one even knew because Good Tiger ratio. was playing. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, JJ Spawn tees off in the Masters and Tiger's there. Did he actually tee off? That's from the gallery <laughs> uh, by Truly Hard Seltzer. Go trulyhardseltzer.com. Check out where you can get some. So I got a laugh from the crowd there. <laughs> yeah, you're you're fishing for some uh, support right now. I want it on record saying. Trent and I might have to distance ourselves from your stance. I don't want to fight JJ Spawn because he'll beat the shit out of my dainty little body. You should. You said you couldn't see him behind a, a grain of rice. He'd still beat the shit out of me. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, okay, that was from the gallery. <laughs> Great time. There's um, no way I'm going to put that in the show, are we? We're about to throw it down Chipnuck, who's, oh, yeah. who's okay. just incredible. A phenomenal, phenomenal interview. One of the better writers in the world of golf. Has been for decades. Great guy. And, um, and he wrote an awesome book that's absolutely taken over the golf world in a lot of ways over the last few months at different times. It's popped up. Now it's out. It's available. Phil, the rip-roaring. Unauthorized biography of golf's most colorful superstar. Bang. Um, anybody in Scottsdale, in the Arizona area, come to Casa Amigos. We're going to be there Friday, Saturday, Sunday, pretty much from 11 a.m. all the way until coverage ends. Live feed, live stream, PGA Championship watch party. Let's go Tiger Woods. Let's go Rory. Let's go TaylorMade. Let's go Kiz. Let's go everybody. Hit it hard. Here's Alan Chippen. Hit it hard. Hit it hard. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined, I believe, for the first time on the show you never write you never call <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, we're gonna get to all that uh, we have a man who's hot in the streets right now has been for several months for years really but especially last few months um alan shipnuck fire pit collective with our boy matt janella so i have to mention that thank you go check out everything you guys do there and then you're a little bit you know you're a little bit all over the place you write for a lot of different um outlets you cover a lot of different things but the latest is obviously the book on uh, phil which we've read um, how's it, you know, how's it feel to, how's it feel, A, to have it kind of out now and be done with it? Yeah, it's a relief because, you know, we, we put that excerpt out in February and you would never usually drop an excerpt that far from publication date. Right. It was just all that Saudi stuff was coming to a, a boil and I felt like I had almost like a 
fiduciary duty to get it out into the world because people needed to have all the cards on the table and make you know decisions about what's really happening here. And, and so it's created this long run up. What and was that decision like to release that? I, I mean, I literally, I, I was one who had to press publish and you know, my finger hovered for a second because I knew things were gonna get a little squirrely. I, honestly never imagined it would blow up the way it has and some very smart people in the golf world had read the manuscript and they you know we knew it would be controversial and but phil has talked his way out of so many controversies in the past yeah he's a, a master manipulator of the media and never in a million years thought he'd be in this this exile for this long but uh, to answer your question to get the book out now people can read it in its totality and see that it really is like a fair balanced look at a really complicated guy it's a relief because the world we live in, you know, the excerpts, they have to be a little sexy to get people's attention. Like yep. I said to my, I said to my editor, what if we do like an excerpt about Phil's philanthropy and all his random acts of kindness? He's like, nobody cares. Nobody's nope. going to read that. No, no, no. no. <laughs> people like the negative stuff, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Or even just the stuff that has some sizzle. So, yeah. um, so I'm happy the book's out and people can, can judge it in, in full. Give me the full title again, Phil, the, the rip roaring. Yeah. And unauthorized. And unauthorized. Biography of golf's most colorful superstar. Apologies on how long it is. No, I like it. I, uh, I will say my, and Trent and I talked about this uh, on Sunday when we got to Tulsa. My um, takeaway, my biggest takeaway from the book was shockingly different than I expected it to be to the point where I actually think I came away liking Phil more than I did going in. And, and, and Phil is such an interesting case in that Phil is someone who everyone has heard a ton of rumors about. Everyone uses the word phony. And I've, I've heard he's this. I've heard he's that. Every person that, you know, is, is um, representative of the normal golf fan back home, one of my buddies, whatever, that now finds me in this weird situation where I kind of, you know, they think I know more than I do, ask me, like, what do you hear about Phil? Because, you know, everybody yeah. has that. And the book, I thought, did such a good job of sort of addressing that of like, here's a story about um, some really, really genuinely good things Phil has done for people that you probably haven't heard about. And then here's a story about Phil that might be a little bit more, you know, sketchy on his character. And and so my biggest kind of takeaway is that there were dozens and dozens of stories of him and Amy doing phenomenal things for people that if you've never heard about them, clearly they weren't doing them for press. They just were doing them as good people. Right. Yeah. Like I think like you, you, they throw around the word phony and that's in the book and people do say that about Phil, but you use the word complicated. And I think that's a good way to put it because like Rick said, there's all those stories in there that are just like, that's not a great reflection of Phil. But then the one that stuck out to me was the Ryan Palmer story where as soon as his wife, yeah. you know, gets diagnosed with breast cancer, he pulls Ryan Palmer aside and is like, here's the people you're going to talk to. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to get the best you know, medical people in this field, and it all worked out. So I think phony it could be, or it could be complicated. And I think if you read the whole book, and I think it's a very fair and balanced look at Phil, I think he is incredibly complicated. That's yeah. the best way to put it. Well, I mean, I appreciate both of you guys saying that, because that was ultimately my goal. Like, I'm, I'm not here to tell people what to think about Phil. It's just like, I'm just, I'm just laying it all out there in all the contradictions, which we all have right. as humans, but his are exaggerated because it's been such a big life. Right. He's such a big personality. He just chews all the scenery. And so, yeah, there's, it's a little bit of a journey on this book. And I've had people say like, I'm, when I was done, I was confused. Like, I don't know how I feel about Phil. And, <laughs> yeah. and to me, that's a compliment as the biographer, because I don't want to tell you what to think. Like, th this is all that I know and, and all that I could get in print. And now, and now you make up your mind. And so, yeah, but I appreciate that from you guys. And. Uh, yeah, there's just there's there are so many multitudes within Phil, and people ask me that all the time. And that's one of the reasons I did this book. Is like, what is Phil like? And I say everything you've heard is true. He can be incredibly charming and generous. He can be an asshole. He can be manipulative. Uh, he can he's got all of these parts of his personality, and that's what makes him so interesting. Which is true of like almost everyone, right? I yeah. mean, to some degree, yeah. It's you know, I, I really liked because you were when you first kind of started to discuss in the book the gambling stuff. And you had a, a line in there that was sort of like, to be honest, nobody would really care about any of this because it's not illegal to be just, I mean, if you bet and lose your own money, who cares? Reminded me a little bit of the Michael Jordan stuff where people right. were trying to, you know, find, find ways to kind of drag down this absolute superstar, Michael Jordan. People were like really hammering the gambling thing and during playoffs and he went down to Atlantic and people were like, oh, you can go gamble. That's totally fine. You can spend your money however you want. Um, I wrote down this quote um, from Hunter Mahan who said he's not phony, he's just kind of goofy. I've never seen any kind of fake side to him and I've never seen him be rude to any person. So when it comes to the word phony with Phil, how do you think it applies? 
Yeah, I mean, one of these critiques you hear from his colleagues is, oh, he's just out there signing autographs as like public relations. Like, if the worst thing you can say about somebody is he's too giving to the fans, and oh, you know, he leaves all that money for the locker room attendance, he's like showing off. Well, these are the guys cleaning the shoes. Like, they could appreciate that thousand dollars. Right. Know, like, if if that's the worst thing you can say about somebody, they're doing pretty well. So, I, I think. Phil's aware that it helps his legend to, to give the girl at the lemonade stand a hundred bucks, but it's also, he doesn't have to do that. And like, you know, there's just this little throwaway thing in the book, but there was this waiter at Augusta National who was up for promotion and Phil wrote him a letter of recommendation. Like he does not have to do that. Wow. Like he, he does, he does care. He does. They said this about Arnold Palmer, like no one could have as much fun being Arnold Palmer as Arnold Palmer did. And it's kind of the same with Phil. He loves being Phil Mickelson and <laughs> the, the grand gesture and all that stuff. He, he thrives on that. Um, but then, you know, there's this things in the book where he gets in people's face and he's, you know, like they, they even tried to co-opt me, you know, his, his attorney yeah. calling and, and offering to make me a consultant as Phil's going to take on the tour. It's like, that is the most glaring conflict of interest. I cannot take Phil's money while in the middle of writing a book about him. Like, duh. But that, they're always working an <laughs> edge. Like, hey, yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. They're always working an angle. Phil never opens his mouth out an agenda, so it's it's just part of his inherent contradictions that he can he can be so magnanimous and he can be so petty. So um, the the first time I really got to speak to you quite a bit about the book was in October. We were abandoned, and you were start you were giving me tidbits, talking through me, uh, you know, the process and how you know you would obviously you allow you let Phil know that it's that's coming, and here's kind of what I got. With it. And then you know a month or so after that was when you had the conversation and. You got the comments and the quotes that obviously the entire world is read now. You know, were you surprised if Phil called you up? I was. I, mean, I went to Phil three times face to face and asked him to sit for interviews for the book over like about a five month period. He thought about it. He mulled on it. And ultimately he said no, which was fine. I've had so much access to Phil through the years and his people. I didn't really need him. I, I explained to him. I thought it was in his best interest to tell his side of every story right. and do a little spin, but whatever. And so fast forward 10 months the book is due December 1st. It's now Thanksgiving weekend. Like I'm done with the book. I'm putting the last coat of polish on it. And after I had that, that weird exchange with his lawyer, yep. you know, Phil texts me, says, Hey, can, can we talk? I was like, of course I've been trying, I've been trying to talk to you for a year. And, um, so I, given that he turned me down, I was surprised, but when you know, Phil, and it's been said many times, he has to be the smartest guy in the room. Oh, yeah. And he just couldn't, help himself. He had to tell me that he had gamed the system and he was smarter than Jay Monahan, the PGA Tour Commissioner. He was smarter than Greg Norman, the mouthpiece for the Saudis. Yep. And he'd cut all these backroom deals and he was so proud of himself. And so ultimately he didn't want to talk to me. He said no, but he could not help himself. And it tells you a little bit about Phil. Like he's always stirring the pot and he always has an agenda. And I mean, like take the 2014 Ryder Cup, which I think is a fascinating mm -hmm. part of Phil's legacy. Is, was he fueled by grievance because Tom Watson benched him? Of course. Yep. Did he enjoy like flaying Tom Watson in front of the world on a personal level? No question. Yep. But it was also a very principled stand where he's like, we've been getting our teeth kicked in for 20 years. I'm tired of losing. We need change. And mm -hmm. the only way it's going to happen is if, if I make this a very public issue. And so he put his neck on the chopping block. And now the U.S. has won two of the last three Works. Ryder Cups. They're probably going to win the next five. Yep. And a lot of that dates yeah, back you've to... you said that before. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> New question. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that was Phil as an agent of change. And he's always saw himself that way. You know, smacking the moving putt at Shinnecock. Was that petulance and childish because he was playing crappy? Yes. But it was also the USGA had lost control of the golf course yeah. yet again. All the players yeah, were pissed. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. And and I Phil know. wanted to make that public, and a lot of players were cheering for him. So he's not afraid to put himself out there, which I respect. And he's talked his way out of it before, but this time, you know, he, he kind of lit himself on fire. So uh, we're at the PGA Championship. He is the defending champion, and he's not here. That's an incredibly rare, rare precedent. Uh, almost never happens, especially for someone who is is healthy and, and could play. Are you surprised he's not here? Yes and no. I mean, I have people who are DMing me photos and videos of playing golf all around San Diego. I haven't posted them. It feels a little too invasive, yeah. but but he, the swing looks good. He <laughs> looks like he's put on a little way. He's got a little beard, but I mean, he's playing golf a lot. So I can't speak to how well he's playing, but he's out there grinding to some extent. But I think the ground has shifted beneath Phil's feet so quickly. He's gone from this beloved elder statesman and he's taken like this heel turn and now he's like kind of a bad guy. Yeah. And he's caught between these two worlds. Is he going to pledge his fealty to the PGA Tour? Is he going to go all in with the Saudis? And that whole situation is so chaotic, you know, with 
uh, without getting in the weeds there, like we don't know what's going to happen, and it's probably headed for court. And I think Phil was just not ready to return to public life, where there'd be a lot of tough questions, and he would sort of have to pledge allegiance to one side or the other. And uh, so I think this was just about buying time, um, see who's going to be the first guy to, to break the blockade, go over to London and play yeah. in that Saudi event. It yeah. might be him, it might not. And uh, he, he's just he's just not ready yet for for the, the tough questions. Right. That's the conclusion that we kind of came to, where. We were asking, like, why hasn't he shown up? Why didn't he play at the Masters? Why isn't he playing the PGA? And what it probably comes down to is he doesn't have the answers that people want to hear or he doesn't have the answers himself. Because it's yep. easy to say, just show up, take your beating a little bit, get asked the hard questions and give the answers. But if you don't have the answers that you think you should be giving or that you even have in your own brain, then you just don't show up, I guess. And, he, yep. yeah, it builds the swell even more. But it might be better. Apparently, he's calculated in his mind that that's better than showing up and giving answers that are just going to people are going to tear him even more. Right. And I mean, he's even sort of taken the fifth, like to not even put out a statement about not defending the right. PGA. That was bizarre. Yes. Like, and just let the let it's up to the PGA of America to put out some some milk toast tweet. Like, yeah. that was weird. But I think he's afraid anything he says is going to be the wrong thing. And so he's just gone underground. Which is so. Uh, such a reversal for Phil Mickelson, right? Yeah. I mean, he he can talk his way out of things, as yeah. you've described in phenomenal detail for hundreds of pages. That's what he does. And if, if there's ever a situation that, like, okay, someone is clearly up against it, they've done a heel turn, they're getting it bad from the media, people have piled on, if there's one person that really could artfully talk their way out of it, and inevitably will, right, which yeah. you put in the book, that, like, yeah. there will be a moment he's he's thumbs up at everyone and that yeah. we're going to clearly get back to that point. The public forgets very quickly. Things blow over. I'm just shocked that he hasn't just shown up yet, taken his licks, because he's going to have to do it eventually anyways. Yeah, he's, he's just not ready. And it's complicated because the people around Phil – are a little problematic and his agent and his lawyer who are kind of his two you know consularities yeah. they're not talking to each other and um, you've heard a lot of stuff we don't know what's going on with Phil and Amy there's just like I think there's a lot going on behind the scenes and that adds to this this dissonance where Phil's just not ready to take a stand because he doesn't even know what he believes in and he's at a real crossroads professionally and personally because I think if he comes back and he says you know what I thought I was I was just being a, a tough businessman. Maybe I overplayed my hand. I'm sorry. I love the PJ Tour. I'm just here to sign autographs and have fun. People will forgive and forget. Instantly. I mean, instantly. I, instantly. Especially with Tiger Woods here playing and, and taking over all the coverage. Like, it would just be that thing that he does. Yeah. We know we see him. And it's, yeah, to yeah. me, as just a, a Phil, I'm a fan of Phil. I'm a lefty. I've always loved Phil Mickelson. I just want to be able to see him go out there and answer those questions. And I get it, if he doesn't have them. It's just, yeah. it makes me think that the worst the worst of the worst of the worst is actually happening when I don't hear anything from him. Well, I mean, that you can't call it an apology, but his public statement in February when he kind of took this leave of absence, that last paragraph where he said, I failed a lot of people, yeah. I need to work on being a better man, yep. that felt like it was a lot bigger than the Saudis. Like, Big time. That Big kind time. of read like a cry for help. And, and so, yeah, you know, I become this clearinghouse. Everyone's calling me and tweeting me and DMing me, like everything they've heard. I've heard oh, every, yeah. every possible rumor, innuendo, what could or could not be happening in Phil's life. I don't know what to believe anymore. There's so much. But there's, he's clearly dealing with some stuff that is beyond golf. Uh, but, again, he, there's a road back. I mean, however, if he goes all in with the Saudis after everything he said about them and us knowing his true feelings and after being educated on the toxicity of their dirty money and and how it's still an emotional issue for a lot of Americans because they did supply 15 of the 9-11 hijackers and they did assassinate a Washington Post reporter who was a resident of the United States. If he still goes in, all in with the Saudis, it's going to be a lot harder to Phil, for Phil to get that love back because I think a lot of fans will be turned off. And so, so he's at a monumental decision between guaranteed money versus goodwill versus trying to get back in good grace of the corporate America versus this need to to be a, an agent of change and be vindicated and prove that he was right and there's a lot there and so I think that's why Phil's not here he just needs more time to let it marinate he's trying to, he's trying to crunch those numbers well, right and another yeah. thing is that what you talk a lot about in the book is what is Phil's financial situation like where are we at with that like yeah. how badly does he need the Saudi money how badly like what is his current financial situation for a guy who was making 40 million dollars a year at one point like what is he actually like what does he need right now and I think that's a huge question for him that is like you mentioned Michael Jordan's gambling like, 
it d theoretically didn't affect his his career, right? He, he even said that he was just kind of like, yeah, just, but it's I'm not, a competition not... junkie. Right. But where it gets interesting with Phil is, you know, it's in the book the scale of his gambling losses, like deep into into eight figures just during this this four year period that was scrutinized by the government as as part of the Billy Walters right. insider trading. So now you have to ask, like, why is he chasing the Saudi money so hard? He's he's threatening to blow up the entire world order of professional golf, and reshape the entire landscape, and why? And part of it is he wants to be right, and he wants he wants to be this revolutionary. Like that's he sees himself as like Thomas Paine and <laughs> pleated pants. But it's also, you know, it feels like maybe there's a more necessity when it comes to the, that that Saudi money. And, right. And so that's where it gets really interesting because, you know, I've heard from people in the game. Oh, he already took a huge advance from the Saudis. You don't want to owe those guys money. No. <laughs> like nope. they're, they're, they're the last people you want to owe money to. And so now well, if it, you don't owe them money, it's yeah. you're in dicey territory. <laughs> now you owe them a lot. I mean, yeah. look, yeah. look at the so, positions that Greg Norman has put himself in. We don't know anything, but it's like it sure seems like he's got a lot more invested than just what like. What about your I position? Want this. Have you felt nervous about being in the mix of all this? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I've heard that. Clearly, if the Saudi Rams are going to execute 80 people in the town square. They don't really care about public relations. Like they're just gonna do their thing. Yeah. But um, true. So <clears throat> no. But it's not like I'm sleeping with one eye open. But it's definitely <laughs> there's. Your mind. Yeah. I, I did get an email today from a guy who's got a Saudi Arabian government email. He's like, please call me so we can clarify a few points. I'm like, okay, I'll call you right back. Yeah. No problem. No <laughs> so, problem. I mean, me nervous having you on the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll call, I'll call you from the yeah, hey, let, let me just hide behind yeah. Trent here. This like, interview <laughs> may never hit the airwaves. <laughs> it's all yeah. jokes aside. Who's Alan Shipnow? Like, that's a, that is something to kind of. I mean, did you factor any of this stuff yeah. and when deciding to write this book like not only that but also affect someone else's life whether it be negatively positively or, or whatever like does yeah. that when doing something like this does that really affect you yeah i mean there's a human element and i will say that i was told something that would have been very headline making for the book but the people that it directly affected I spoke with them and they begged me not to use it because it said it's turned their life upside down. What well, was it? And, yeah. So <laughs> let me whisper in your ear. Real quick. And, and you know, it's really harmed them. And I, they confirmed it. I mean, I pretty much had it cold, but I'm not a monster. I don't want to like right. send these people back to therapy or whatever it might be. Like it's really been a big thing in their life. And so it's not in the book. And um, you know, even those are tough decisions. They're tough decisions. And there's even stuff that I know to be true that was about Phil's family that felt too personal. I took it out. Like, and I mean, I sent Phil a long request for comment when I was done with the book that had all the juiciest stuff. He never got back to me. He, he went, his lawyer call, called me. And one of the things I said, like, are you sure you want to say this? And, and the lawyer came back and said, yeah, Phil would appreciate it if you take that out. And I said, okay, I will. Because, you know, there are certain lines I don't want to cross. And, uh, you know, everyone is entitled to a life with some privacy. Now, when you, when you get to the issue of the betting, it's it really becomes a a, a real thing that's affecting professional golf. Right. Like I, I would say at that point, you've kind of forfeited the right to privacy when you might blow up the PGA Tour. Yeah. And um, and so uh, on and, that issue, right? On that you issue, you might exercise the right yeah. to privacy on other yeah. issues. Yeah. And like, you know, one of the big questions was why did Phil and Bones end their relationship after 25 years? They seem like brothers, right? Mm -hmm. And they put out these chummy, like, you know, his and her press conferences uh, or press releases. But you may have observed this too. If you're at tournaments, you could sense a little edge there. Oh, yeah. Like I saw them walk past each other without even looking at each other. And there's a, plenty of player and caddy breakups where they still wrap it out on the putting green. Right. And there's still a kinship there. Like they've been in the arena together, but that was totally absent. And so like to get to the bottom of that w was a great mystery. And again, you could say, well, it's just their business, but when they're out on the golf course between the ropes, like when, when Bones was moonlighting for, for Justin Thomas and they were paired with Phil, you know, a couple years ago, and there's an energy and an edge, and it felt like it's affecting the competition, I think that, again, this now becomes part of the public domain. Like, there's right. something going on here that is of value into understanding why it might be affecting performance, why it's affecting the way they conduct themselves at tournaments. So. There were a million judgment calls in this book. And I will say I'm the keeper of so many secrets because everyone wanted to tell me everything. And a lot of it was off the record. Some, we had these ornate agreements about how it would be sourced. I flew off to see this guy who's done a lot of gambling with Phil. Like, not only would he not let me record it, I couldn't even bring my phone into the room or a pen or a piece of paper. Like, he wanted no evidence we'd ever talked. Yeah. And, and he told me something else that was an absolute bombshell. And but it was off the record and I couldn't use it. And it gives us like, ah, oh, it hurts. Oh, yeah. It's like, ah, oh. like it's, it crushes me as a reporter at information gallery, but we had an agreement and I always honor those agreements. It's just good to hear from our side because you want to know that the world actually 
continuously goes like that. Like I, I don't want it to always be where everyone's trying to get other people just to get them. You know what I mean? And the fact that you did your due diligence with this, you have all these things because you know people's lives get ruined. People make mistakes, and you talk about that. And it's awesome to hear that you know how you went about this. It's really journalistic cool. integrity. Yeah, jur- well, you have to have it. I mean, I appreciate that. And again, my, my goal. And people have said, because reading the excerpts, you kind of got, as you said, you got a little flavor of the book, but you didn't get the whole meal. And so right. b- before people have had a the chance, they're like, oh, is this a takedown of Phil? Are you out to get him? I said, no, I, I like Phil. I've always enjoyed being around him. It's been a great joy to cover him. Because think about when he came out in the 90s, like who were the big stars? It was like fucking Mark O'Meara, Lee Jansen. And, yeah, all these boring motherfuckers. Right. Now, like Phil made our lives so much richer as golf fans and people who cover the game. That was the Charles Barkley part I thought was excellent towards yeah. the end when he said, great he's quote. like, yeah. he's just like, you know, I, I known Tiger, I've known Phil really well. Phil's just really fun to be around. Yeah. And people are just smiling at around Phil and people aren't around Tiger. Now that changed yesterday with us. But like <laughs> I thought that was a really good point of just like, yeah, yeah, I don't know about all the bullshit, but guess what, man? I love being around that guy. Yeah, no, that's a, that that runs through it. And and so it was important for me to capture all that. But there's also the messiness and the controversy, right. and that's in there too. So um, ultimately I'm I'm just trying to tell the whole tale and it's like spreading out a big buffet and you'll take this and he'll take that yeah. and you'll have a little different you'll have a li- little different uh, taste of it and I'm not telling you what to eat or what to think like it's just this metaphor has gone on too long anyway but the point is <laughs> like, it's just no, no, there, there, there's this? something what for everybody want a little lemonade? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's something for everybody and um, I think there'll be a wide range of reactions I think people who love Phil will probably love him more because they'll focus on all the philanthropy and all the, yep. the mentorship and the people who are filled detractors, they'll pick out stuff. And I'm interested in the people in the middle who are kind of ambivalent because that's going to be that's going to be interesting to see how they react. Yeah. To the stuff book. that Riggs and I have been talking about the most since we since we first talked about it was the bone stuff. I think yeah. the bone stuff is just really interesting and a lot of things that just people didn't know about. Yeah. And I think like you're saying, there's going to be people on either side. I think the people in the middle, which I think we sort of are, is like that's going to be one of the main takeaways because that stuff was it was eye opening quite that honestly was, that was I, I I said to Trey I thought that was the most actually salacious of the entire you know thing that was the most surprisingly salacious and you know we know Bone we were chatting with Bones today for a while so when it's somebody that you know that also you know people like a lot and then you hear it kind of went down the way that it went down you know that that was probably the most negative I thought for like the a lot of the Phil stuff for me which was also the most surprising and it's interesting for you to hear from your vantage point that going in that was all sort of a mystery You're like all right I sense something there's a little bit of iciness here yeah. I got to get to the bottom of this you were basically starting from nothing yeah I mean I heard I'd heard some things but yeah. uh you know there's always noise surrounding Phil that goes back to the 1990 USA Amateur, you know, it's all laid out in the book. Like some of those old stuff is hilarious. Like the 91 Walker Cup, his comment about Fantastic. The, the Irish women oh in the gallery. Gosh. Like that stuff's hilarious. To excavate all that was was a joy. But yeah, I mean, for people who haven't had a chance to read the book or the excerpts, or whatever. I mean, money was at the root of that breakup with with Phil and Bones, and the FedEx Cup came along. They'd already had a pretty established payment system. So how do you reconcile this bonus money? They kind of agreed on something, and over time, Phil never paid it off. And and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and eventually bones by his accounting was owed nine hundred thousand dollars that's a lot of money a lot of money for anybody especially a caddy yeah and um and phil never made him whole and, until the whole thing was coming apart and uh, you know it's crazy. it's crazy and but what's you know what's interesting is for a guy that made 40 million a year at one point yeah but how much how is nice it? bones is but, like i mean <laughs> right but, but how much brought us waters and like snickers today <laughs> yeah, he did <laughs> crazy. he yeah. did but it's not what you make it's what you keep so now yeah. it gets into a more interesting question but totally. then you know, then there's the 18th hole flags, which in Bones' moral universe is a graver sin than the money because, so we all know that- You could sense it in way, just in the book, it's like, yeah. that was the thing. The that money was, is one thing. Yeah. The 18 pin flags is yeah. a big deal. Yeah, so we all know when the, when the caddy takes the 18th hole flag, it's that's just that's their trophy. They don't get a big Wanamaker trophy. Hideki Matsuyama's caddy made it super Iconic. famous. Yeah, Iconic. Unreal. And, and so Phil always kept those flags and he gave them to his grandfather who taught him the game and was a- was like the North Star in his life. And so Bones didn't love that, but he kind of understood it was a special relationship. And that went on for 21 victories. And then sadly, Al Santos dies at the ripe old age of 97, had an amazing life. And telling his story was fun too, by the way. Yeah, it was great. And, um, yep. and so now they keep winning tournaments, including you know four majors, and Phil's still keeping those flags. And Bones is like, what the hell? Like him and his wife would host you know players and caddies during the Phoenix Open, and people would come to their house like, where are all the flags? And it bothered him. 
in a fundamental way that none of us could ever really understand. And I mean, it'd be like the equivalent of, you guys aren't allowed to wear the, the, the Barstool logo. Like, like yeah, you'd be Riggs like, won't let you wear it, too bad. Right. You know? You'd be like, well, right. I mean, right. Why right. Riggs owes me money, but it's kind of ridiculous you won't let me wear the yeah. fucking yeah. logo. Like, you can right. never wear the <laughs> logo. And, and, um, Give me the logo. <laughs> yeah. It's like a sense of power over him, too, yeah. right? It's like, and, I own this and, and you don't. And yeah, so it's, um, you know, the money that times the flags. I don't know. Yeah, the money times the flags plus some other stuff like it led to this very acrimonious breakup that nobody really knew about. And so to lay it all out there and, you know, poor Bones, like he's on the golf channel because he has his knees replaced and he, doesn't, he needs a little break from lugging the bag. And he gets he has to talk about Phil and he's like super chipper and, you know, yeah. insightful, like and poor guy was like kind of performative, but he had, that was his job. That was the role he had to play. And um when you think back on it now, you're like, damn, like he, that guy should get an Academy Jeez, Award. Yeah. That's amazing. Right? Yeah. Would you like a delicious drink, Trent and Frankie, that's good for you, Trent and Frankie, that has electrolytes, vitamins, antioxidants, coconut water, and tastes great? Trent and Frankie? Yes. I would love that. Do you know what that I might love be? coconut water. So Me if we too. can th put coconut water in everything, I'm in. Body Armor Light. Okay. That's what we're talking so about. So good. Is the low-calorie sports drink hydrating your active lifestyle. We are active this week. We're all over the map. I have it's body active armor. as I've been. Stocked in my fridge at home. I got a really cool fridge. It's got a little screen on it. Cool saw it. Wow. That oh, thing's yeah. like a magic trick. Dude, it's crazy. I couldn't the figure screen? it out. The fridge is insane. Scre your fridge has a screen? Yeah. Like the it's guy a who helped smartphone? Me out, I have a guy who helped me Does it out. it talk? A PC Richards who essentially got me like a bundle of the coolest TV and the coolest refrigerator. I'm not saying it fell off the truck, but I got a good deal. Well, if you're doing every podcast, being like, "Hey, if I if there a refrigerator guy out there, you know, I couch pay my guy house. out there, I had to pay for him. Table guy out there. It was, it you know, was that nice. that that refrigerator is it's technological. That's why, we're out here. That's why I'm traveling the fucking world, pay for that one refrigerator. <laughs> um, but I will say, I have it stocked with body armor light, and that's not even a joke or just for the ad. It's right there on the right side. I've got their huge bottles, and I have them lined up on the right side. I love the flavors. No matter what flavor I pick up, I'm telling you right now, it's so refreshing. You have the competition. It doesn't give you the refreshing quenching of the thirst that body armor does. It's lighter. It's It tastes closer to water, but it has the taste. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Sometimes the other ones get phlegmy, and, they, and it just you drink them when you're soaking hot and you're sweaty, and you drink a com com competition of body armor. I don't know if we're allowed to talk about the competition. And you end up just... Blech. Body armor Body light. armor goes right down, man. I'm telling you. I didn't realize it's delicious. You get all flavors on Amazon. Go check it out. That's what we drink. That's what our super fancy refrigerators yeah. that I don't have, but that Frankie has. Is, I write uh, notes on it. Is, Good morning. Really? Oh, yeah. Does it say it out loud? Does it talk? It does a lot of things, dude. I can see the cool. inside refrigerator from my phone right now. See what we're like missing. What? It's like wild. it's a baby camera? You just like see the shelves. Unbelievable. It's a wild. It's wild. We're going to look at that when we're done here. Yeah. Why would you need to see the shelves? If you're at the grocery store, you want to see like, oh, do we have any butter or something? You're like, oh, Fucking let me go a. look on the inside. I would have the Very same smart, question. Actually. I would have the same question you had, and then he just answered it with like, the best answer. Do we have well, yeah, beer I was in there. Be like, oh, yeah, what I is see the milk no like up and there. talking? And you, like, what are, <laughs> yeah. what's going it's on? Like, it's that poor person's like, Toy Story's gotta be real. <laughs> <laughs> We're putting cameras everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> the butter is now hanging out with the cheese. This shit's real. This shit's real. Dude, that what's that? They're plotting a tank. What's that? Um. What's that movie where they... Oh, uh, it's uh, the Seth Rogen Seth movie. Seth Rogen, where they're all like, oh, hot dogs and shit. Um, oh, sausage, sausage Party. Sausage Party. What a weird movie. Really body good Armor, movie. Body Armor Light, all flavors are available on Amazon. Uh, I want to talk about some of the on-the-record, off-the-record stuff, because yeah. clearly there was a disagreement with the comments about Saudi and Phil claiming yeah, that they sure. were off the record. I mean, how, how... Is that just a case of just one person just lying? Yes, and it's not me. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, as I said, I went to Phil, you know, three times and asked him to do interviews for this book. And he knew I was dying to talk to him for this book. And there are judgment calls. Like, you guys know, you, you're just BSing with someone on the reins. And they say, hey, you know, did, did you hear that uh, so-and-so broke his hand in a fist fight in a bar? You know, player, caddy. And like, well, that's interesting. You might want to use that on the air, but you'd say, you, it's not a formal interview. You're just two guys talking. And you'd say, hey, can I use that? And they'll be like, well... Uh, okay, but don't use my name, or okay, but let me clean up the quote. I don't want to say, you know, yeah, yeah. It, whatever. And there's a little dance you do, and that's part of this intimacy between the players and the reporters. But I would submit this is a very different scenario. Like, I have gone to Phil three times, and I've begged him to talk to me. And now he's finally ready to, to talk to me. And he calls me. He instigates the whole thing. Like, every single syllable is going directly in the book. 
unless he tells me otherwise. That's been and made very clear. It's made exceptionally clear. And he never asked to go off the record. If he had, I would have pushed back really hard because it's a two-way street. Like, it's a it's a consensual relationship, you know. Right. And um, if he had asked, I'd be like, no, dude, this is our only t chance to talk. Like, and maybe we'd hash it out and say, okay, you can use this, you can't use that. He just started talking and he opened a vein. And it goes to his motivation, like, why? Mm -hmm. And I just think... Phil was so desperate to, to show me how smart he was and that he had he would he was smarter than everybody else in the game and that he had masterfully pulled all these levers of power and it just he couldn't help but tell me and you know when he picked up the phone did he mean to tell me everything I don't know I mean you guys know that, talking you guys know this from your job people start talking they get carried away they, they get emotional Trent had to like defend uh, Ukraine one time in a in a draft about I, alcohol I, I, let's not, I don't want to bring that up I don't want to talk about that. I'm just making a point. I don't want to talk about that right now at all. He said white Russian. Is that what it was? It was, yeah. Russian drink? And you had already drafted. You almost got canceled. Pretty much. And then you just running downhill. I drafted a... drafted about cocktail drinks, and he had to say, I support Ukraine, and I'm not... He came out, he's like, boys, it got really sideways. And then we're like, what happened? Why did you just draft like a margarita? I felt like I was on fire. I was just like, my whole body was engulfed. It was, yeah. But that's how it is. Yeah, so, you know... How far Phil wanted to go, I can't say, but it's not my job to give him guardrails. Like, yeah. he tiptoed to the edge of the cliff, and, and he looked down, he's like, ooh, that looks refreshing, I can take the plunge. Like, I'm not the lifeguard. Mm -hmm. Like, this is not a jittery rookie doing his first ever interview. This right. is a master manipulator of the media. This is a guy who spent his whole career charming and bullying and cajoling reporters, and that's all in the book, too. And uh, the, I, the idea that he would tell me anything I didn't want to know for this book is it's nonsensical. Like, Phil, uh, he never opens his mouth without an agenda. Right. And now, he wildly underestimated the, the, the blowback. And honestly, so did I. Like, I knew what he was saying in the moment was, was going to be controversial and was going to provoke a reaction. Like, I never imagined he'd be sent into exile for all these right. months. And at the, after I was done kind with the book. self-sent to exile. Yeah, oh, yeah. So it's a kind totally. of a combo. But like some really smart people in the game read the manuscript and my editor and my agent, and all these people, no one flashed on it. Like we talked about a lot of other things. Like not one person said, wow, this, this could end Phil's career. Like really? it just, cause when you read the whole book in the context, it almost feels inevitable. Something's coming, right? He's always, he's got, yeah. he's he'll got, win and then he'll say something stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's, you start with the, the, you know, the insurrection at the Ryder cup, then you go to Shinnecock Hills, then you go to him battling that that the reporter in Detroit about oh, the mobbed up bookie yeah. story and like Phil has kind of made himself this agent of change and this 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 guy who wants to take things on so this you could feel this coming in some ways but when you get the excerpt all that's cut away and so it it's a little more uh, glaring and it, I think it had a little it was more impactful that way and stripped away of some of the context so again that's why I'm glad people get the whole book and they can see it how the whole thing unfolds but um, it's a wild turn of events, and I never could have predicted it. Since the those quotes were released, which was uh, the excerpt was released in February, you said? Yeah. Have you heard directly from Phil? The day they dropped, he sent me a text expressing his displeasure, and I wrote back and then had more to say a little bit later, and I texted him again, but it didn't go through. You know, you get that little green line. Oh, that's a nightmare. So that's that, yeah. a trick. And then some other people told me they've tried to reach out to him. So either I was blocked or he changed his number, but other people couldn't get through either, so I think he just changed his number. And um, I did send him the book a few weeks ago with a handwritten note, I sent it to his lawyer, he said he'd put it in his hands, because I did want Phil to see it before the public, and knowing he's probably trying to decide is he going to play this tournament, like, I think he, he deserved to know what's in the book and see that there's, there's not any more earthquakes that, uh, on the magnitude of the Saudi stuff, and everything else he can survive and he, he can probably talk his way out of, and so I wanted to give him all the information. I haven't heard back. I haven't gotten a critique yet. Do you think he's read it? In your book, in your just guessing. Yes, I, I don't know how you could it. Like, yeah. if if someone wrote a book about your life that's been everywhere and and turned your world upside down, I think you'd probably want to read it. Well, I remember uh, Zuckerberg um, when what's the movie I'm liking on the name? Oh, Social, Social, Social Network. Social Network, Social Network came right? out. He had said for like a year. He's like, yeah, yeah. I don't. And then day one, he went like with his whole staff yeah. and they saw the movie. And he's yeah. like, yeah, it's pretty good actually. Anybody yeah. who has a book written about them, they read that book. Yeah, that would yeah. be my guess. Without a doubt. I mean. You know, Phil... Does that make you nervous? Not nervous, but, like, uncomfortable, you know? Because yeah. you have a relationship with the guy. Yeah, I mean... No, I'm glad he's reading the whole book. And I, I sent a handwritten note, and I said something to effect, like, I hope you can read this with an open mind and see that it was written with a lot of affection. And that's the, that's the honest truth. Um, whether he can do that remains to be seen. But, I know, I'm glad he's getting the whole book. And you can see there's, there's a lot in there 
that, that celebrates his virtues and there's there's a uh, you know get into the, the, the large scale philanthropy he's done and all his mentorship of young players and uh, he's he's spread a lot of goodwill through the universe a lot. and I was happy to celebrate that and and I think it's an important part of the book so um, but again you can't just tell one side or the other so so all all the controversies in there too and when he sees the whole thing hopefully he'll be like yeah okay I don't love it but it was fair do you think you and him will inevitably have a long sit down someday that's a great question I hope so I mean the, the book starts at the 1999 PGA Championship when Phil's in my face and he's like saying just throw the first punch awesome you know? start by the way yeah. I, I, yeah. you dive right, right in yeah thank you and um you know, we've obviously had our ups and downs interpersonally. As I lay out in the book, you know, I've been to his house, we've dined together. When he won the, the Open at, at Muirfield in 2013, I was drinking champagne with him and Amy. Like, we, we definitely buried the hatchet and I, we had a productive working relationship, even if there was always a little edge there. Um, so I would like to think so. And I, I'll be curious when Phil comes back to public life. Is he gonna attack the book and attack me, which is fine, you know, it's- Good been, for sales. It's good for sales. It's Hopefully been, it does. It's been vetted by a team of, of Simon Schuster lawyers. I'm not worried about that. It, <laughs> um, or is this pledge to be a better man, is, is he gonna, maybe this self-reflection he talked about, maybe he'll say, you know, it was fair and I deserve some of that. And uh, um, that's a mystery, we don't know, but it'll be interesting. That, that first press conference, I'm sure I'll be in the room, like that's gonna be awkward as hell, but uh, it, you know, for both of hey, us. Hey, Phil. Yeah. Phil, yeah. Alan Shipman, you know, fire pick collector over here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can we talk oh, about that seven iron on number 13? Yeah. yeah. It's it would be so deflated, right? Did you catch that a little heavier yeah. there? Or what was, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe I'll just go just pure golf. Like, just, that'd be amazing. That'd be amazing. Uh, that's just all you cover with yeah. Phil now. Yeah. 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 But, that's what the uh, tweak but, in the clubs you're using in the bag yeah, there. Yeah. Is that a, but, you deal off your three wood a little bit? Yeah. I mean, there's, Phil and I have always had this funny relationship. Like, I mean, this is in the book, but he already knew I was doing it when he went to the November Masters, and I asked him a question in the press conference. You know, he's in that big cavernous room in Augusta National, and he gave some little answer. He's like, uh, I said, you know, is it fun for you to come in here and perform on this big stage? Because he doesn't do too many pre-tournament con press conferences anymore. And he's like, yeah, you know, I've kind of kept a low profile, but I'm always happy to come in and see you, Alan. And like, you know, it was like, so it was, there's a term I learned when I was in the South called smile fuck. You know, he was kind uh -huh. of smile fucking me. And, but it was funny, like I, <laughs> I enjoyed it. And like, we've always had that banter. And uh, so, you know, I'm sure he's mad at me. He may be mad at me forever. And that's, that's part of the job, but we'll see what happens. I'm always amazed, overwhelmed really by the book writing process because I, it would be overwhelming for me. And when yeah, you mentioned yeah. vetting it with the lawyers, the sourcing juggling the off record on record yeah, yeah. yeah that's is, is it ever just overwhelming you're just like uh, oh man you got a family you know you're yeah, coaching know. you know you're coaching well, girls yeah. high school basketball you got a lot going on a lot going on and honestly so i started working on this book in the summer of 2020 and it was you know it was the peak or maybe the nadir of COVID, however you say it and it was great in that there was no access to players at tournaments but everyone was home and bored and I had so many like hour, hour and a half long conversations. The Hall of Fame golfers who had literally nothing better to do right. than tell me their Phil story. So that was great. Mm -hmm. And then worked on it really hard in the fall into the winter of 21. And then in, in February of 2021, really launched the Fire Pit Collective and spent three months just grinding, you know, day in and day out. And I didn't touch the book for three months. And in early May of 2021, I, I called my editor. I was like, I cannot get this book done for 2022. There's just no way. I'm so far behind. He's like, fine, no, no big deal. It's evergreen. 23 is fine. 24, take your time. And then, you know, less than two weeks later, Phil wins the PGA Championship. Oh. And, that, and that Sunday night, I get a text from my editor. Books due December 1st. <laughs> Don't let me down. Yeah. I was like, fuck. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, it was intense. And But it was also, I thrived on the energy. And, you know, like my son, who's 14, he'd come in, say goodnight. I'd be at my desk, it'd be midnight. And he'd like... He's, he's a really affectionate kid. He'd get in my lap and hug me. He's like, I'm sorry you're having to work so hard. I was like, buddy, I'm having a great time. Yeah. Like, this is a blast. Yeah. Yeah. Like, cause like during the day, I have my day job, I have my kids, I have all this stuff. And I did most of my writing from like eight or 9 PM until whenever. And the phone you know, quiets down. Sometimes I even just turn the Wi-Fi off. And that was bliss. Like yeah. I looked forward all day long to getting to that point. And, yeah. Interesting. And, and so it is a lot to juggle. And, you know, I did hundreds of interviews and while I have the interview notes, I have the transcripts, like you kind of have to know in your head what you got. Right. And so you can just, you can find it and, and, and put it where it belongs. And so the, the amount of clutter was unbelievable. And every time you finish a chapter, you, know, you can close a bunch of tabs, find your research and you can kind of 
cut and paste some interviews, put them in another document, like, okay, I'm done with that. The college years are over, like, yep. thank God. <laughs> and so, you know, I've been doing this not long enough that, you know, that's my seventh book. I have another one coming out later this year. So I've, I've done this, I've been through this process mm. and I kind of know how to compartmentalize and I can already see the chapters before I even write them. And so it gets easier, but yeah, it's, it took over my life for sure. Man, that's wild. That's just, yeah. it's cool. It's, it's what it takes, right? You immerse yeah. yourself in it. Uh, yeah. I feel like you probably are, it, I imagine it would be weird to in person even see Phil Mickelson now because you've been so immersed in his life. Yeah, that's true. I mean, my, my first year covering punch you in the face. I mean, he's been waiting thirty. Sales. I mean, he's been waiting a quarter century for someone to throw the first punch. That's it. Right. It's not you gonna, do You it. might see the book as the first punch. <laughs> well, that's well said, Trent. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, believe me, when when we. If we square up, I'm ready to duck, man. Like I like. Oh, that'd be. I if, mean, but if he I, plays in a live golf event, is all the media going to it? And so that's interesting. I was just talking to Matt Janelle about this. Like, part of me doesn't want to legitimize it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I've been very critical of the mm -hmm. Saudis through the years, and especially in the context of this book. Rightfully so. Yeah, we know they're bad actors on the world stage. But on the other hand, this is a big moment in golf. Like the whole world order of golf is threatening to be blown up. And so I kind of feel like I need to be there, even though right. it's the week before the U.S. Open and it's, it's, it's a complicated time. But uh, got kids graduating high school and all this stuff. But I kind of feel like it's going to be a fascinating exercise. The energy around it is going to be unusual. Uh, it, you know, if Phil goes, I'm sure I'm going to go. At least we'll know that a few days ahead of time. But yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a it's a big moment for the sport. I mean, it's an existential threat to the PGA Tour. And how this all plays out is going to be utterly fascinating. There's yeah. nothing else like it in the sports Literally. world, right? Nope. Yeah. I mean, I what mean, other league th is yeah. threatened by an existential league? You know, the XFL is a joke. Yeah. It has right. been forever every time they've tried it. No, you probably is... have to go back to the USFL in, like, the yeah. 80s. Right? when, Because that was, that was never going to be the NFL, but they had some blue chip talent, and they had some money, and they had some TV. Like, the whole thing blew up, but they tried, and they made a run at it. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's unparalleled. And, you know, these – Golfers love to call themselves independent contractors. Yeah. That's why they don't go play the Quad Cities and whatever, because they can pick and choose. But the reality is it's more They don't go play the Quad Cities? Where's that? Is that <laughs> near <laughs> Iowa, Trent? Is that Zach Johnson? I mean, some people think it's the fifth major. It is but, the fifth major. <laughs> what was the year they had zero out of the top 50 players in the world play? Uh, continue with your point. I, I, I was more <laughs> interested in that one. <laughs> My point is they're not entirely free agents because if they want to go play – in these live golf events, they have to ask permission from the tour. And being a tour member confers great benefits. All these humongous bonus programs, the best pension in Ever. sports. Yeah. yeah. And so they, it's kind of like having to ask your spouse for uh, permission to cheat on them, you know? Right. And they don't always give that permission. And right. So, and then <laughs> claiming that you're single. So, yeah. well, I mean, right. yeah. not really. Exactly. <laughs> kind of so, married. Yeah. <laughs> it's messy. And uh, so how this is going to play out is going to be utterly fascinating. And you know, for the players, they won't say this, but they want the the Saudis to succeed because the dream would be you can keep your tour membership, you can play the FedEx Cup, you can cash the pension, and then you can cherry pick all the Saudi events that you want with these monster paydays. Like that's the dream scenario for these guys. And uh, if if this is sanctioned by an antitrust judge, then it gives them some cover. Like, hey, the federal government said it's okay for me to go over there. It's all right. good, guys. Uh, well, one of the great ironies of this whole thing is that Phil has actually been extremely successful. Yeah. Like, the tour has had to do all sorts of things oh, yeah. in reaction to what this threat yeah. has been. No doubt They've about had it. to come out with the pip and the bonus and then raise the pip and the bonus and then yeah. raise the prize yeah. pools yeah. for the all these tournaments. The purse is insane. They're outrageous like, now. Yeah, People yeah. are winning two, three, four million dollars yeah. and they win a tournament because of what they've done. So, and ironically, he's gotten what he wanted. That's part of the irony or, or maybe the tragedy of this is Phil had a lot of good points and he was actually making progress like he was he winning was. these battles. right they created this nft program that's largely because of phil's advocacy and um so if he had just maybe stayed the course and not worked both sides so hard but just uh, wouldn't call that one ship if that if one fucking I, night I, I, God I, damn I mean it. i sometimes wish he never called me <laughs> yeah because like the book was done i it was doing a week like i was just you know adding a few commas here and there but it was done and yeah. it already was really lively and really fun and it was juicy i had the bone stuff i had the billy walters i had yeah. the gambling there was enough stuff in there to satisfy the people who, who wanted the secrets and if he hadn't called me this would be such a different moment for both of us right. and like i think about that sometimes i mean once he told me that stuff it would have been like journalistic malpractice not to yeah. use it i could never have not but like if he'd never picked up the phone and by the way it was a sunday afternoon during football season like um 
enough people have said to me, do you think Phil was drunk? Yeah. Like, yeah. I've had to think of it. I mean, he's not really that kind of drinker. He's more like a nice bottle of red at dinner. Yeah, you said he hates it, and tastes, he hates tastes it, with beer. Which, which is ironic because he pimps beer uh -huh. for a living. Like I was just going to say, oh, he's maybe having a couple of beers, but like yeah, that's not Phil. That's not Phil. So he sounded fine. I, I don't think he was under the influence, but... You just you know, took advantage. <laughs> you just like... Public relations like <laughs> took advantage of Phil Nicholson. <laughs> yeah, it was just like, it just, it just happened. Um, I'm sure he regrets the phone call. I know I think about it all the time. And like he used the word reckless in his statement, talking about that whole conversation. He was reckless, but I almost think that was part of the fun for him. He is an adrenaline junkie. Yeah. And whether it's trying to carve a three iron around a big Norwegian elm on the 72nd hole at Wingfoot, when he could have just laid up and played it safe, like I think he kind of got off on telling me these secrets, knowing it was dangerous. But he couldn't help himself. Like that that's my only analysis of the situation. Like I would and not that have, actually makes the most sense. I would not have known this stuff if you hadn't told me. It's yeah. crazy. Uh, you called that drive the worst drive in history. <laughs> in golf, I mean <laughs> First of all, all it, things considered, it was 100 yards offline. Worst in history. But with <laughs> so much at stake, like not only the U.S. Open, which you know would have ultimately given him the career Grand Slam, uh, in hindsight, but he would have gone to number one in the world. He would have been Player of the Year. All these things he's never <laughs> been able to attain. They were within his grasp, and you said given the stakes and the result it could quite possibly be the worst drive in golf history there's no question <laughs> we're all safe yeah we're, all safe. Right. we're good yeah you can hit 100 yards offline it doesn't matter this was so much at stake and you know obviously we've talked about all these other things there's a lot of fun golf stuff in in this really book. good oh, golf and stuff like that chapter on wingfoot is one maybe my favorite part of the whole thing awesome and like I read the audiobook for this, which was a great challenge and it was a lot of fun. And I had this little engineer in my ear every time I'd mess up. And um, he'd always tell me, he said, I know when something exciting is coming because you start reading too fast. And I got to slow you down. That whole chapter, man, I was racing through because I was dying Couldn't to get wait. to the last hole. And, and to bring all those voices who are like Monday morning quarterbacking, you got Big Jack, you have Hale Irwin, Andy North, Nick Faldo. Um, you Bones know, chimes in yeah, hard Bones, like, about like, the. Yeah, like all these people who have won multiple U.S. Opens or the, are these great tacticians and just wilding out on Phil. Like, it's unbelievable. <laughs> and But I was right there. I mean, I was. it's in the book. But I was standing in the fairway with Rick Smith, his swing coach, as Phil was looking over the second shot and trying to decide what to do. And when Phil hit that shot and he caught it, you know, he caught it flush. He was lucky it went in this trampled area. Mm -hmm. He had a good lie. And it was heading for the tree. It was like in slow motion. And it hit that trunk. It's still the loudest crack I've ever heard on a golf course. It was just, the acoustics were unbelievable. And Rick Smith went ashen. Like his life oh, yeah. just changed and he knew it. Like before that ball, you stopped rolling, he's, he's done, he's fired. And, um, <laughs> and, and it, just, it just unspooled from there, like in this horror show. Um, you know, Phil gives his famous, you know, I'm, I'm an idiot press conference. And uh, I mean, he looked, he, he was wearing a yellow shirt. He turned that color coming up the 18th yeah. fair. Was like he, the magnitude hit him. The Ford yellow shirt. Yeah, exactly. The Ford. <laughs> um, and so, you know, part of my job is to go where the cameras can't go. And so after all that plays out, it's like, where's Phil? And so I went into the, the Wingfoot Clubhouse, which is a great old-timey clubhouse. Fantastic. Seen it. Yeah. Yep. He's upstairs. One we of got, my favorite bars in all golf. Oh, yeah. Out there at Wingfoot. And those ginger snaps at the oh, turn with really? the peanut butter. Excellent. Oh, Excellent. I had like a thousand of them. And, <laughs> you know, the fans are in the ceiling. It's all hot and stuffy up there. And... Um, Phil's got his head in his hands and he's just broken. Yeah. I mean, I've never seen an athlete so broken. And, and Amy comes up and she whispers, and she's like, I think he's in shock. Like, it was probably a good medical diagnosis. And um, it was just incredible. And, you know, those are like the little stolen moments that I think give this book like a real intimacy because I was just there. I've been there for, for the victories, for the slapstick defeats. I've been in the press tents. I've been in the parking lot. I've been on the putting green. I've, I've been in his freaking souped up golf cart where you know we're hitting 50 miles an hour and the tires are chirping on every corner and he's like admonishing me for not turning like could it, you know i'm like hanging out of it like to, to combat the g-forces like so i i've been there like i live this stuff with phil and i mean it's been a journey for both of us in its own way and to, to bring it all together uh was was a great challenge but it was also it was a heck of a lot of fun i love the moments when you guys do one-on-one -on -one and he reaches across and turns off the tape recorder yeah to like tell you things yeah yeah i mean that like, that's the thing like he's so cagey <laughs> and um so the, the idea that i somehow outfoxed him in this phone call is ridiculous yeah like, right, right like he he is a master manipulator and uh you know just he just just this one time he just didn't quite read the room and uh, he's still the the fallout's ongoing yeah
Well, look, it's a it's a fantastic read, um, and like you just described at the end there, I mean, there's probably nobody better to write it. You've been there for all 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 sorts of moments with Phil. So, um, Alan Shipnuck, go check. It's out everywhere now. Right? Everywhere, yeah. Give us yeah. the title one more time. Phil, the rip roaring and unauthorized biography of golf's most colorful superstar. That's good <laughs> awesome. Read. It's perfect. It's a great read. The read's we, better. The read's faster than the subtitle. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 we'll get through the book quick. No, we appreciate it. It's a great read. Uh, I highly recommend everybody go check it out. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, guys. This was great fun. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank, Thank you, Alan.